Good morning and good evening to everyone's joining the meeting. Please allow us a few minutes where because we are starting to accept to admit uh audience coming in. Okay, uh, good morning and good evening to some colleagues who are in on the Eastern time. Uh, a very good morning here in Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm very glad to 
have everyone here, some of us, because uh, I'm sure that we will have uh, more people coming in to join us. So my name is Paulista. I'm the communications coordinator from WRI Indonesia, and I'll be hosting uh, today's session. And welcome to the online second sessions of the Southeast Asia Air Quality Community of Practice. The second session is titled Increasing Awareness Through Ambient Air Quality, Data Analysis, Interpretations, and Visualization. Uh, today's session coincides with the Air Quality Awareness Week 2024 uh, that is initiated by the U.S. Department of State. Uh, so it's really timely uh, that we gather here all the professionals, uh, CP representatives, who focuses their work on air quality uh, on these occasions. Um, on to next, I will be responsible to, to share uh, the snippets of our agenda today. So allow me to, to summarize or to capture uh, what we have today in the next few hours. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? Okay, so we'll have the first 10 minutes to, you know, to, to get uh, ease into this, today's agenda. Uh, and then we'll start with the introductions from Beatrice. Beatrice is the Air Quality Director uh, from WRI in Mexico, but also the co-leads for all the WRI air quality portfolios. Uh, and then we'll begin with the first sessions uh, by Chris Hegebomer from the Open AQ, uh, entitled Increasing Awareness Through Data Sharings and Publications and the Importance of Communicating Ambient Air Quality Data to Public. And we'll have and then we'll have a question and answer. And the second part of of today's sessions will be sharing or presentation from cities representative from Jakarta, from Malaysia, and from Mexico City. And we'll also have a, qu a question and answer then. And we'll conclude, we'll close uh, by 12. Uh, on to next. So some housekeeping, uh, welcome again. Very glad to have everyone here. Uh, please be kindly informed that this webinar is recorded uh, for documentation purposes. It's for non-commercial purposes, but mostly for archive uh, of, of the several sessions, uh, of a collection of sessions within the community of practice that will be accessible uh, public. Uh, you are encouraged to utilize the chat box for discussions and for networking during the session. Do share, if you don't mind, your name, your affiliations, maybe your interests. Uh, also, to ask questions, we kindly request that you use the Q&A feature because then it will allow us to address any inquiries effectively. And... Of course, we invite you to sit back and get engaged in this insightful content. And should you require any assistance, should you encounter any technical issues, I mean, if it's on the, during the session, uh, you can perhaps, you can you can use the chat box, you know. Uh, we all, some of us stand by here. Uh, we have colleagues from WRI Indonesia who's co-hosting the sessions, uh, but, for further inquiries about the community of practice itself, if, if you wish to get to know it more, uh, you can send us an email and you can also con uh, connect with our air quality researcher, Kali Shah, who, uh, whose email is on screen. Also, once again, I would like to remind, I would like to inform that there will be interpretations in Bahasa, uh, in Bahasa Indonesia 
and the, the language uh, speak, spoken here in the session will be English mostly, and there will also be an interpretation in Spanish. So thank you again for your enthusiasm, for your kind support. Uh, let's begin. Uh, maybe Kalisha, uh, we can have the next slides. I think we have Beatrice uh, here, right? I think I saw Beatrice. Yes, I am here. Okay. Uh, Beatrice, I'm about to invite uh, you to give the introduction to today's sessions. Uh, I'll just give a quick introduction about you, but of course you can, you will share again uh, your interest and your expertise, but uh, Beatrice Cardenas is an NFRT director in the World Resources Institute. Uh, she also co-leads the global air quality team and where uh, WRI Global. Uh, Beatrice's expertise is in air pollution with a background encompassing both scientific research and policy development. Uh, her experience ranges from studying biological processes to treat air pollutants to designing and implementing comprehensive policies aimed at achieving clean air. So without further ado, maybe Beatrice, you can take us to your, your session on introdu introducing or giving context to today's session. Thank you, Paulista, and um, thanks everyone who are joining us. Good morning, good evening. Um, Paulista, may I join? May I share my my screen very quickly? Is is that okay if I if I share my screen? Yes, that that, that should be okay, and we can we can see your screen. Okay. Um, well, I, I think that that the, the the whole idea of of I mean the, the idea that uh, the team WRI uh, Indonesia and and the team in WRI had for this for this session is to to share some ideas um, and to identify what are the options of using the data that is being generated by cities. On air quality, um, from their air quality monitoring uh, reference stations or any other type of monitoring stations that they have, in order to raise awareness of the uh, of the air quality uh, that they or the air the air or the quality of the air that the citizens are breathing. So, as you will see today, uh, uh, we will have presentations of. Um, many um, participants who have been working for a long time on not only assuring that the data is being generated and on the other hand is using this data to to to, to share with others. So um, I I just in order to make this idea is well we we all know why is air quality so important. What the, uh, is of course to to make the case that people are breathing bad air and that's causing a lot of uh, problems in their health, causing mortality and morbidity. But we also have to remember that the air quality is also affecting crops, it's also affecting our biodiversity. And some of these pollutants are also, are also hitting our planet. And they are also affecting some of our water uh, systems. So how, uh, without forgetting this raising awareness of the air pollution problem, how can we send all these messages by the, using, the, the use of our data? So I have some questions that I hope that we can also get through the, through the session, is how can we use visualization tools to increase awareness from the data that is available? How can we make more available this data that the cities are generating or other organizations are generating? And the last thing is that, can we learn from what other cities are doing? Can we do a benchmarking and get ideas and, and in, in order to increase this awareness when the data is there? And just some, some examples, I was doing some, some uh, I just wanted to show you how can we use visualization? And of course the message is different, but let's use the data that has been reported to WMO and, 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 and has been used to present 
how the population is exposed to bad air quality. And this is just one example from Resource Watch uh, on, on using data from, this is actually data uh, gathered by the World Bank, just showing what countries are exposed to high levels of pollutants over the period of 1990 to 2017 using uh, global uh, data from that has been gathered by the World Health Organization. Another example that also is, is useful when, when cities and countries are reporting the data of the air quality, uh, from the air quality monitoring data, in this case is mostly reference, moni uh, reference monitoring stations, is how, how can we compare, how can we make the case that the air that we are breathing is, is not good and, and, and there are differences, and, but there are also similarities by many cities in the global south and some cities in the global north that are exposed, uh, that are having air pollution problems. This visualization can only be possible if data is available. And, and also if that data is clearly, um, it's, it's clear how this data has been generated and where it's coming from. What type of monitoring uh, uh, of, of equipment is being used, for how long has been used, and exactly uh, how the data has been managed or has been uh, curated or reviewed in order to make this, this type of, uh, of visualization. I was also uh, making the point of, can we share from other organizations or other cities how the data is being used to visualize? So this is an example of Air Now, the monitoring stations from, uh, from embassies how if you want to know the air quality right now, how you will be able to access, but also see it. Um, this is another example, how Bogota, the, the Secretary of Environment shows the data, the real time data in different monitoring stations, either by monitoring stations or by extrapolating the data. In addition to have this access to the data to real time, they also have access to uh, archives of data that could allow others to make analysis and help also in the analysis of the trends, the difference from one monitoring station to another. This is another example of the uh, uh, California Resource Board. They, if you want to know what is the air quality right now of a specific uh, monitoring station in a county, you can ask um, the system, but you can also have access to all these archives, what data you want to retrieve, what data can you, can you download. Uh, this is another example from Air Parif, how they visualize the data that they are generating and how they also show this, in this case, it's an extrapolation rather than monitoring site. And again, with, when all this data is available, then other groups like the, the University of Chicago gathers it, they, this data and then make another type of visualization using this data, doing some other analysis on health impacts, and then to generate another type of indicator like this one, the air quality life index. Again, this is possible when the data is available, when data can be used by others to make the uh, other type of analysis. Um, so I, I will say that uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that today discussion, knowing what, what other cities are doing, we can get some ideas and maybe start a discussion on, on what can we do in order to use the data to, to increase the awareness of the, uh, of the problem that we are all facing, which is air pollution. And with that, I, I will stop, uh, Paulista. So maybe is 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 the time? Should I? Um, I think that someone else will introduce Chris, who is yes. our next speaker. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay. So thank you, Beatrice, for setting the context for today's sessions and. Again, emphasizing the importance of connecting science and to policy. Uh, to the next sessions, very proud to have uh, Chris Hegebomer, the executive director from OpenAQ. Uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, Chris 
is the executive director and since March 2022, she provides strategic leadership, runs operations, and manages OpenAQ's mighty team, and also cultivates collaborative relationships in pursuit of a core human right, that is the right to breathe clean air. Uh, Chris came to OpenAQ with 26 years of experience, mostly in the nonprofit sector. Uh, Chris, for the next few minutes, I think we have I think we have around 20, 20 minutes, right, for dedicated to Chris' presentations. So very much. Do we have the presentations ready? Okay. Can everybody hear me? We can hear okay. you. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you okay. And you can see my slides. We can see your slides okay. All right, wonderful. All right, wonderful. <laughs> All right. so I am calling in from Portland, Oregon, which is on the west coast of the United States. Yesterday it was 10 degrees Celsius, today was 25. So I wanted to go outside and get in the sunshine today, which was wonderful, but I love seeing you all this evening. Um, so again, I'm executive director of OpenAQ. My name is Chris Hagerbaumer. And again, we're quite a small team. Um, okay. There we go. So first, uh, Southeast Asia, you all live in one of the most beautiful parts of the world. The, however, the only time I was in Southeast Asia was 1991. <laughs> so I need to come back. I not only went to Indonesia, but also the Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. So it was a fantastic trip. Uh, I had just spent two years in the Republic of Palau, uh, which is an island nation near the Philippines. And uh, this was my jaunt around Southeast uh, Asia. So I thank you all for inviting me to uh, participate today and a special shout out to CAC Jakarta who, uh, who, who, who invited me. So I'll talk a little bit about OpenAQ in a nutshell, why we exist and what we do. Talk a bit about the benefits of sharing your quality data and I think that Beatrice set it up super well, like how do we communicate ambient air quality data to the public? Uh, so I, I have just one slide related to that. Jumping right in, um, we our goal is, our mission is to provide universal access to air quality data to empower a global community of change makers to solve air inequality. We started in 2015, we became an NGO in 2018. You all know that air pollution needs urgent attention. I won't go into that part of the slide. But a, 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 an issue is that a lack of data obstructs action. So data are fundamental for us to understand and take corrective action to improve air quality. Unfortunately, um, OpenAQ did an analysis looking at what countries in the world monitor for air quality and then how open they are with their data. We found that a billion people in the world live where their national government doesn't even monitor for air quality at all. And then in many places, even if monitoring is occurring, the data are often impossible or, or difficult for anyone to access. In fact, only less than a quarter of countries provide maximally useful air quality data to the public, access to that. So our ethos is that data transparency is critical. We believe everybody has a right to know what's in the air. You all know that Air pollution doesn't confine itself to borders, so we need to de-silo data both within and across regions. And, and open data, 
basically allow everyone to participate in the solution. And I'll get to that in deeper level a bit later. So we are working to overcome data obstacles. We have built the world's first and largest open source, open access database of outdoor air quality measurements. So we're basically a one-stop shop for both real-time and historical air quality data. We're universally and easily accessible. Right now, the data are free to anybody. We actually plan to start charging folks who use the data for commercial purposes. That, that's upcoming. Our data are also uniquely valuable. We have taken this disparate data around the world and we've harmonized it so that it's very easy to compare and it's shared in physical units rather than as an air quality index. Air quality indexes have their place, but they don't allow for deep analysis of data. And then finally, basically we're our resource for analysis, communications and advocacy, and we have enabled all sorts of applications and initiatives around the world. This is just a visual, we're aggregating that disparate data we're bringing it on to an open source platform. We've harmonized it for ease of use, and then it's utilized by diverse users. More specifically, here's a map of, of data. Now, you all have probably seen this before. This is kind of the opposite of that map that Epic put out, because this is showing where there is open data, mostly in the more affluent parts of the world, and that there's large swaths of the world with with, with either where there is no monitoring occurring or the data has not been made open. In, indeed, actually India and China do quite a bit of monitoring, but their data is not fully open. So it's not, we have historical data, but not current data from those two countries. We aggregate from both reference monitors and air sensors. Um, we have built tools for developers that help them utilize the data. We have more than 12 billion data points in more than 26,000 locations. We are mainly focused on criteria pollutants and black carbon. And so that's, 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 that's the nutshell slide. Um, this is, I, know I won't really spend much time on this, but when you look at data science, there's a whole, uh, a pyramid structure to it that that we we get at how to analyze and so on and visualize, but there's a lot of stuff that happens has to happen before we can do any of that. Open AQ is really focused on the part of the pyramid about collecting, moving, and storing data, and then making it available. We are serving. I would say our primary users are scientists, researchers, and, 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 and analysts, but we also serve other users like nonprofits and civil society organizations, people who communicate about air quality, governments, uh, businesses like tech companies and other entrepreneurs, and even individuals. Our whole goal is to help people use data to improve air quality. Just a few use cases. So the global burden of disease, which is the most comprehensive study of the causes of death, disease, and injury, relies on data from OpenAQ for the air quality section. That burden, global burden of disease report is in turn uh, used to inform policymaking worldwide. Another example is C40 uses data from OpenAQ to determine whether interventions are working. For example, let's say a, a low emission zone has been put in a city. They'll use an annual average based on OpenAQ data to determine, well, has the air quality improved over time? And then the third one, let me spend a minute on this. There's a uh, fantastic uh, new, fairly new predictive model that is really, I believe, the most accurate in the world. It was built in Los Angeles, but is being used beyond Los Angeles to predict air quality. It is an open source model that any city around the world can, can 
adapt to what you want to do related to air quality forecasting. If you're interested in that, let me know and I can connect you to the team that has developed that model and then and continue to develop new tools related to that model. A clean air catalyst, I just, you all know about the clean air catalyst, but this, but OpenAQ's role within the clean air catalyst has been to, mainly to support data needs. Uh, another thing that OpenAQ does is, is, is run our, our community ambassador program. This upskills emerging air quality leaders in low and middle income countries around the world. The 2024 cohort looks like we have only one person from like, if Southeast to the, I'm not sure exactly what, how, well, in any event, the Philippines this year. Um, uh, last year, we also had a couple folks from Southeast Asia, um, both in Jakarta and Bangkok. Uh, Abed here from Pakistan describes the program as a boot camp for everything air quality, and it's really been an amazing program. So how do you access data? Uh, you can go to our website in the upper, upper left-hand corner, click Explore the Data, and it takes you to our OpenAQ Explorer, which you can then type in a city, a country, and you can find whatever open data is on OpenAQ, hone in on a reference monitor or an air sensor and get uh, more expanded information about what that air sensor is measuring and so on. Uh, you can create lists of the ones that you want to follow that you are most interested in, a personalized list. Um, so as an example, it looks like this, oh, we honed in on Uganda. I'm actually not sure where this, this slide says, but it's it's taking a look at an air sensor uh, and it's, it's showing what readings are related to, um, gosh, the, this is a variety of particulate matter measurements. And, um, it puts out time series and diurnal plots and a, so a few different graphs that help you understand what's happening with that data over time. However, if you want to go deeper, which uh, most researchers or scientists are going to do, you use an, an API to access data and, and, and download that data. And we have all sorts of documentation on, on how to do that. Uh, and we, again, we have built tools that help people who are programmers interact with the data on OpenAQ. So let me move to the second piece of this. Why share data in the first place? Uh, I mentioned, I, I believe that people have a right to know what they're breathing. And our theory of change, our logic model is that when you open up air quality data, Everybody from civil society to government to the private sector to academia can help solve this very urgent problem of air quality. Bringing people from different sectors with different backgrounds and different knowledge and experience can lead to more solutions, better solutions, more innovative solutions, and solutions that last over time. When you share open data, it allows for more cooperation and, and knowledge sharing and, and building of trust. And when you open data, those people who have been on the fringes, who have not understood what's going on, marginalized communities, can begin to understand better what's happening and advocate for solutions that, that support them. So specifically, I think that most people on the call are from government. So let me just dive into this a little bit more. Forgive all these words and that I will read them, but I thought they would be useful to write full sentences so that people can read this, this afterwards. But open data can create greater trust with citizenry. It allows uh, your citizens to better understand what you're doing to support the public good. It opening non-private, data, it's a way to meaningfully engage with, with citizens, and, and it's a demonstration of accountability and responsiveness. 
also, this is an interesting example from the air quality space. As, as governments, you likely have reference monitors, which are put out the most accurate data. So let's say a community group has put in some low cost sensors, which are typically not as accurate. If you share your reference data, then that potential misuse of over-reported or under-reported data from an error sensor is lessened because that ac you've put out the more accurate data and it's readily available. Um, now, not sometimes a reference monitor can be off as well, but in, I'm talking about a typical situation. Open data also improves information flow either within uh, sections of, of a single government or within between local and, and national government or even international government. There are additional benefits if you share your data with OpenAQ. I just showed a variety of visualization and analysis tools that you might not want to create on your own, but would be available if you, if you shared your data with OpenAQ. There's also an ability for you to share OpenAQ data on your platform if you're interested. We have a, 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 a way to build a map into your website if you're interested in, in sharing other data. Going back, if you share data with OpenAQ, uh, and we can actually field individual data requests for data downloads, and that could ease burden on your agency. Um, I don't know if we have anyone on the call from an NGO, so I guess I won't go into detail on this so that I can kind of catch us up on time. But basically, there, I'll, I'll, I'll just be brief here. Community-based organizations, when they share they, their data, they are empowering more members of the community. Uh, also, because many foundations and governments are, are requiring or strongly encouraging open data, it improves the chances of, of funding. And it can benefit the broader environmental justice movement. Researchers can compare, combine, follow connections among different data sets and, and, and then identify inequities in, in different regions, highlighting the trends and benchmarking progress. Likewise, similarly, there's, there's greater visibility for a project. There's the opportunity for long-term data storage. I'll, 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 I'll describe this for just a moment. Many um, researchers and community organizations are using private companies that are offering sensors as a service, which means that you, you're purchasing these sensors and paying monthly or paying quarterly. Well, when you no longer have the money to pay, what happens to your data? You don't actually necessarily own that data and the pipeline is shut off. So sharing data with OpenAQ means that you have long-term data storage. Um, the rest of these were actually described in the previous slide. And then lastly, um, there are benefits to academic researchers. It, 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 again, there's a whole movement across the world of, towards more open science and, and, and sharing data enables open science. It, it, it enables reproducibility uh, um, and, 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 and scientific advancement, I'm sorry, advancement. And it's more efficient, frankly. If you open up your data, and, and, and make it easier for users to find, then not everybody in the world, not every researcher has to go out and find that data afresh and harmonize it and so on and so forth. That's a waste of time. That's the boring stuff. OpenAQ does the boring stuff. You should be able to spend your time actually analyzing and communicating the data. So um, just moving then, uh, Back to government, uh, these are a couple of great resources on, on why opening up data can be so useful across whatever it is the government is doing. Uh, both the World Bank's um, Open Government Data Toolkit and the Open Data Charter, they have lots of tools, resources, a discussion of the ethos, so on and so forth. So communicating we know people have a lot of questions. 
How clean is their air? Is it safe to go outside? Will air quality get worse or better? And I think almost most governments present air quality data as an air quality index, which is a nice way to just very briefly show people like, is it good? Is it bad? Is it somewhere in between? But an AQI doesn't present the full picture. The data that are direct from a monitor and sensor provide more details than the actual physical, physical units per, per, per pollutant. But, but of course that data is more difficult for the public to interpret. So, so, so I love some of the, the communications tools that uh, Beatrice shared and, and we are always looking for advice at OpenAQ on how to, or what kind of tools we can build for the public. Lastly, I, I hope you will consider increasing the amount of data from, from Southeast Asia on the OpenAQ map. Maybe you know of sensors or monitors that are not displayed. Uh, maybe you're thinking of starting monitoring and, and, and you would need help setting up an air quality platform. So here is how to contact, uh, or here's some of the ways to interact with OpenAQ. And you can contact me. The, the first slide has my email, chris at openaq.org. So I'll stop there and we can go to um, uh, questions and answers and discussion. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I think uh, I'd like to invite any questions, any comments, maybe from, from the audience, from everyone's here, any? Okay, I think it's also quite open if you are willing, if you're okay with uh, opening your camera and also to just, you know, communicate the questions uh, by all means, so. Uh, Okay, Mastomi, you would like to send across the questions yourself. Thank you, Paulista. Hi, Chris. This is Satya or Tommy. Hi, Satya. Yeah, Pin Air Catalyst, uh, project manager from Jakarta. So nice to finally meet you visually. <laughs> so yes. my first question would be, I love to see the Open AQ initiative in the Community Ambassador Program. So my first question would be, when is it going to be open for the 2024 Open AQ Community Ambassador Program? And what would be the mechanism? Uh, is it is it only uh, open for individual to apply or would it be also for some organizations, government agencies to nominate a person to join the program as well? So that's my first question. Uh, sure. This should I answer that one quickly? Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so the 2024 cohort is already moving. They've been chosen. The 2025 cohort, we will probably put out the call for applications in January of 2025. And again, they are for individuals who are basically young professionals, um, who are not too far along in their career, but are working in air quality or adjacent to air quality um, in low and middle income countries. And yes, we want people to share that application process widely so that we get a great group of people applying. And how uh, could we access the, you know, the, the link or the, for the mechanism for the application for 2025? Can you share it with us? Uh, we, well, it's not open. It won't be ready until January of 2025. So I'll make sure to to make you aware of it. All right. So, okay. Thank you for that, uh, Chris. So looking forward to, to hear more about the ambassador program for next year. So the next question is, uh, sometimes we use the word of uh, data and information at the same time or intentionally, but what I understand data is a bit of difference between information. So when we're talking about data, this is something that is uh, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a role still. Not everyone can understand the data. It can be uh, in, in many sectors, not only in air quality. So only specific person can interpret the data into the, into the information. 
So sometimes for you know from for general people uh, like uh, that is interested to see how could we also contribute to the you know to giving or to transmit the 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 appropriate informations and not the wrong informations by our inter interpretation of the data. So my question would be how do you see the interactions between Open AQ or the similar organizations or project that is working specifically on, you know, on uh, gathering the data and put it and interpret it and give it as, as information. And for other organizations, which is not scientific persons or organization that is interested also to, you know, to, to share the information from the data without uh, you know, uh, creating a risk of misinterpretations of the data and information on the on the air quality. Because sometimes I would say that the air quality is quite a uh, heavily scientific uh, field uh, to understand for many people. So I think this is very important that we as a practitioners or as the community members don't share the wrong data and information about the, the actual condition. So do you have any comment on that? So, um... I agree that air quality is a very complex topic. I also think that it shouldn't be the case that only super scientific people should have access to the data. Because I think people there are people are smarter than we think. And 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 um and again, an air quality index alone doesn't tell the full picture. Um, all, all depends on how what pollutants are being used in the algorithm, so on and so forth. And one of the reasons why we developed, you know, the data on OpenAQ, a regular person doesn't really come and download data. Again, that's a little bit too complex. But one of the reasons why we created OpenAQ Explorer is that it does share actual visuals and graphs that can help people look at the data. Um, and, you know, maybe we could be a little bit more um, clear that a low cost sensor is not necessarily going to spit out perfect data, but low cost sensors do tend to trend the same way that reference monitors do. And, and it's this is why I believe that community groups using low-cost sensors as community engagement, they're sharing direct data with their community. They're, they're, they're doing enough to raise awareness that something could be wrong. And then you can talk to government and say, and government can say, hmm, well, you know, maybe something is wrong and we will use our more sophisticated scientific uh, instruments to look into it. And at that, I think that is the point of having these air sensors out there. And, and they're now becoming really ubiquitous in many places, at least again, higher in wealthier countries or countries that have been experiencing wildfires and so on and so forth. More and more citizens are purchasing these. Um, our, the reason why we put out the raw data is, you know, we really started as being for scientists and academics and researchers, and they needed that data. And so we're doing a huge service in that field, but we feel as though anybody should be able to access it. And maybe there are misinterpretations once in a while, but we're, we believe we're still, it's still doing more good than, than not. Thank you, Chris. Uh, A. Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> okay, we have another hand raised. I, I, I do have one I'm question. Good morning, Dr. From Malaysia. Yeah, uh, good morning, Chris. Uh, I think this is the first time I met you through this online uh, webinar, but uh, thank you for the lively and interesting and inspiring presentation. Um, I'm, I would like to have one quick uh, response on the statements that you made that um, related to the air quality uh, index, right? Basically, most of the countries in the world are using the more simplifications in explaining about the air quality generated to the public through the API. But you are saying that it might 
uh, give a kind of like a very general information. So from this uh, situation, what you anticipate uh, the government to embark the journey to have like more transparent and more detailed parameters to be put in place. Can I get some comment on this? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think AQIs are very important. I think they are the, 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 the first entry for most people to see. It's, it's easy. I could look at my phone, right? And I can see, oh, is the air quality going to be bad today or not? That's what most people want. But there are governments in the world that provide all of the data that they are collecting. The, the United States does this, the Europe, most countries, and well, actually the European Union, several other countries provide also the immediate data being put out by their, by their reference monitors. And um, I don't know, honestly, how many individuals go and use that data, but these governments believe that that, that is providing additional uh, value to their communities. And be very interesting, I've never really heard them say that it's somehow resulted in something wrong, right? Um, I do think that, uh, and, and the reason why I said air quality indexes are calculated differently in different places, and sometimes I'll give you one example. Um, in our our technical director was in Argentina, and the morning that he was leaving, the skies were almost black. There was a huge wildfire. Guess what? The AQI said that the air quality was good. It was green. It was because their air quality index did not conclude particulate matter. So it's gonna depend from country to country how accurate those, those, those um, are. So this is why we believe it's important to actually provide um, the, the, the data that comprises the air quality index. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at the Q and A box, and I'll, I'll, I will read the questions so that you can answer it. So, Chris, could you please explain how governments who are producing air quality data can share their data with OpenAQ? Are they recognized as data generators? Yes, so the um so the, the basic thing is to contact OpenAQ and we work to build an adapter to bring the data on and then harmonize it with the other data on on the platform. And that includes every um every uh location that we are gathering data from includes the basically the owner of the, the equipment. So the, that government's is, uh, like if I went to OpenAQ Explorer now, you, would, you could scroll down and pick, oh, um, government of Italy, and it'll show you then all of the, all of the monitors that, that Italy has shared on the platform. Or it might say Clarity. Clarity is a low-cost sensor uh, company that works with lots of communities. So it'll say that's a Clarity monitor. So it provides of all sorts of metadata that is needed to understand the data better. Okay. I think any any more questions that we can answer, Chris? Yeah, uh, Baita, can I ask a question for Chris? Sure. Go yeah, ahead. Thank you, Chris, for your amazing presentations. I would like to ask something about, um, could you discuss any ongoing research or projects that utilize open AQ data to forecast air quality trends and predict future health outcomes, be it in a global or regional scale? Uh, that's the first question. Uh, maybe you can answer the first question. Sure. The, the forecast model that I mentioned predicting what we breathe, 
that was produced in a, um, um, I, I can share, I, I can actually share a link after this to be sent out, I suppose, to the participants, or actually I could probably find it now. I'll, I'll put it in the chat box because I'd like to stay on. Um, so predicting what we breathe is a is an open source predictive model for air quality that again can be any city could could adapt it. In fact, Beatrice might know something. I think Mexico City is working on this. Um, and then like another example of a predictive model is a, a a couple of young folks who are working with UNICEF. They decided that they wanted to build a predict predictive model. And, and to, to explain, this is using satellite data along with ground level air quality data to build the predictions. Um, so they're both of these models, they're looking at um, some areas of the world to, to determine uh, how is the air impacting children. Anyway, that's another example, but this is just these are this is just one of the uses for ground level air quality is necessary to ground truth satellite measurements, which do not, again, tell the full picture. They're not specific enough uh, to tell the full picture related to air quality. I hope that I hope I answered. Yeah, we'll wait for the link <laughs> here. Um, maybe a last question for me. Um, are there any challenges or barriers that need to be addressed to ensure that open data initiatives are inclusive and accessible to all communities? Uh, especially when we're talking about open data, we definitely need like connection to internet. And how do we reach some someone or community that haven't had access to internet connection? Yeah, that is so difficult. Um, honestly, if you don't have access to, you can't really use OpenAQ, the database at any deep level without Wi-Fi, um, right? Uh, that said, we have built, we, we tried to make our website as simple as possible so that it doesn't take up very much bandwidth. Um, that's about the only thing we could do to address that issue. But I agree, that's an important, very important issue. And and the other thing is, is that we kind of see there's an inverse relationship oh, no, no, no. between the countries that are like wealthiest, they tend to be more open with the data and the and the and and some of the low and middle income countries where there's almost no data and it's rarely open, which is again, that's not really helping the situation that you're describing. Thank you for your answer, Chris. That's, that's like a one powerful ask from Kalisha that I mean, I think I would like to invite uh, if there's any from the audience who would like to give a live questions to Chris at the moment, but worry not if, uh, I mean, the whole point of the Southeast Asia Air Quality Community of Practice is to stay connected, is to get network among practitioners, but also air quality uh, focused professional. So I think Chris, you have given your email. So if you don't mind, I think we'll, we'll circulate uh, your email if people want, would like to stay connected to, of course, open EQ and pos any possible collaborations uh, now and in the future. So I think, uh, thank you so much thank for you. your time, yeah. for being here for, I mean, it's in the evening, right? It's 10 yes. p.m.? No, 8 p.m. Oh, 8 p.m. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to... Like I'm trying to wonder because the the window outside of your, it's it looks like it's looking very bright still, but it will I get hope darker. Get to, <laughs> I hope you get to enjoy the rest of your mm -hmm. evening. Thank you again for you know giving your time for being here. Uh, we'll stay connected. Uh, I hope you get to be a part of this uh network of uh, air quality practitioners. We'll stay in touch. And for everyone here, uh, I would like to continue the sessions.
and we'll be having a panel of city representatives. So as I mentioned, we'll have, we are very happy to have the presence of a uh, representative from Jakarta, from Malaysia, so Southeast Asia, neighboring uh, countries, and from far away from Mexico City. So uh, Kalisha, I think if we can uh, put back the screen so that I can give a quick introductions before I hand over uh, this hosting or moderating uh, uh, responsibilities to Kalisha, who is, I haven't introduced uh, her as well, that she's an air quality researcher in WRI Indonesia on the portfolios of Clean Air Catalyst. Um, okay, Kal. Yes. Uh, so um, before you carry over, I'll, I'd like to perhaps take the pleasure of introducing uh, your first uh, panel discuss uh, your panel uh, speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Norhasni Matsari from Malaysia, who is a Deputy Director General Operations at the Department of Environment Malaysia, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability or NRES. Um, before Nor Dr. Norhasni's appointment to her current position, she, she has held various positions within the department and has over 32 years of professional experiences in the field of environmental management. Her area of ex expertise include environmental legislations and enforcement, scheduled waste management, environmental forensics, environmental quality monitoring and management, and she has received awards and recognitions for her contributions in this field. Her responsibilities have also included in overseeing environmental programs, managing enforcement activities, and developing policies, guidelines, and regulations. So a very rich, vast background in environmental uh, science and policy. Uh, and we are very happy to have your uh, of course, time and presence here. So, uh, to Dr. Nohasni and to Kalisha, please enjoy the next session for the panel of cities representative. Yes, thank you, Marita. Um, okay, welcome everyone. I'm Kalisha, and I will be your moderator for this session. Uh, without further ado, I welcome Dr. Nohasni to have your presentation. Never you ready, doctor. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Kalisha, and thank you, Polista, for the nice introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, first, I would like to extend my gratitude to the World Resources Institute Indonesia for inviting uh, Departments of Environment Malaysia at the second sessions of the Southeast Asia Equality Committee of Practice. And I think it's indeed an honor, the first time to able to share some experiences and best practices of air quality data management, analysis, interpretation, and visualization in Malaysia. So um, I think Malaysian overall are uh, deeply committed to community well-being and the environment that we inhabit. And of course, talking about the transparent data sharing is very crucial. And uh, indeed, with the presentations of Chris, uh, this is one of the things that we would like to impart in addressing the air quality challenges and empowering everyone to make informed decisions. And for the our holistic approach includes effective enforcement programs, leveraging the technology and evidence-based policies to cultivate a healthier and safer environment for everyone. That is the ultimate uh, um, directions for Malaysia. So I think during my later presentation, I will share some insights into Malaysia Air Quality Management Program, the methodologies for data analysis, and perhaps some initiatives that are driving positive change in our communities. So let's begin. So this is the outline of the presentation. Um, so we can see, I think we, uh, I'm sharing the slide for everyone here. 
and uh, everyone has the right to breathe with fresh air. So unfortunately, I think uh, today, um, Earth that we are inhabit is facing um, a triple binary crisis. We have we understand that we are encompassing the climate change issue, the biodiversity loss, and also the pollution. And such as uh, the pollution is, I think air pollution is one of it. So today's presentation, Titan simply tell us that Malaysia, like other countries, is dealing with air pollution and cares about keeping the air clean for the health of its citizens. So let's go to the second slide. This is the outline of the presentation. Okay, next. Okay, we can see that as of introduction, um, we are telling that uh, Malaysia uh, Natural Policy and Environment, how does DOE come in towards SDG? And we are going to look about on the regulatory framework uh, up to the strategies and conclusion. Okay, so next, nice. okay. Uh, these slides explain about the National Policy and Environment. So in Malaysia, uh, the National Policy and Environment was introduced aiming to protect and conserve Malaysia's environment and natural resources like land, forests and water for the benefit of the people now and in future. So the objective per se include ensuring a clean, safe, healthy and preserving culture and natural treasures with everyone's help. The policy integrates environmental consideration into development activities and decision-making process aiming for the long-term economic growth and human progress while safeguarding the environmental quality. So this policy is specifically works alongside with other national policies and considers international multilateral environmental agreements that we participated. So from this slide, you can see that there are eight principles under the policy to balance the goals of economic growth and environmental preservation from stewardship of the environment to the active participation in the international community. And today I'm very honored to be together with you here in the WR uh, workshops. Okay, so uh, we'll see what's the commitments of the Departments of Environment. Uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals was adopted together uh, at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. So the 17 SDG represent a worldwide commitment, of course, to ensure the more sustainable, resilience and inclusive development. So in this regard, for Malaysia, okay, uh, the government's development and social economic policies and strategies known uh, as Malaysia Plan. And uh, currently we have the 12 Malaysian Plan, which from 2021 to 2025, which aligns with the 2030 agenda. So this one reflecting Malaysia's commitment uh, to the implementing the 17 SDGs. And for DOE Malaysia, it has been working towards this SDG since the formations of the department. But uh, we also had underlaid many programs that have been implemented to fulfill this commitment with specific focus on environmental sustainability. So we can see the internal uh, circle uh, from SDG 4 to SDG 70s, where those are the presentation made uh, by DOE towards the SDG. So for the ambient uh, air quality, um, the overall uh, overview we can see, uh, I think I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, we can see that the Aerobic Quality Management Program uh, for Malaysia uh, or EQMP, it involves uh, data collection of air quality, river water quality, marine water quality throughout the special Malaysia program and to report the actual level of the nation's environmental quality to monitor, prevent and control the pollution. So this monitoring system um, of the EQMP will act as an early warning mechanism during the occurrence of environmental pollution. So specifically from these slides, you can see that under the EQMP program, 
it provides throughout the Malaysian country, uh, Malaysian states, there are 65 automatic stations, three mobile automatic stations and 14 manual stations that are already in place. So we can see through the distributions of the air, quality monitoring uh, automatic stations in these slides. So we can see uh, the distribution, distributions in the peninsula Malaysia as well as the Sabah and Sarawak in the Borneo. So when it comes to the air, pollu air pollution index, okay, the air pollutant index, of course, as what being said by Chris, uh, this is, is, is not the real one, but it serves as an indicator of air quality status in a specific area. So how the APA being calculated, these APR values are calculated based on the average concentration of air pollutants, namely the SO2, NOx, CO2, CO, ozone, PM2.5, and PM10. So the APR value is determined by the air pollutant with the highest concentration known as the dominant pollutant. So for Malaysia, from the overall measurements that's been made by the DOE, so we can foresee as being recorded the concentrations of particulate matter, but specifically the PM2.5 is typically the highest among other pollutants and thus determines the API value. So now we see the real uh, air quality uh, monitoring network. So the Department of Environment under the Ministry of Natural Resources Environment Sustainable Sustainability did monitor the haze situation in the country, especially during the hot and dry weather. So now we are facing the situation and uh, through the air quality monitoring stations throughout Malaysia, uh, closely monitor the six pollutants uh, parameters. And this one we channel the real data uh, to the EQMP uh, program. And the whole of the information will be channeled to the air pollutant information management system or RPMs uh, to the specific website that has been established. So in addition, uh, the Departments of Environmental Environment Malaysia has also monitored the haze situation in the country through the uh, data of hotspot uh, reported by the ASEAN Specialized Meteorological Center, ASMC, which will be further investigated later by the our state's uh, Department of Environment. And uh, Malaysia Space Agency or MISA also conducts frequent observations on the hotspots and his occurrence via satellite that provide uh, the active fire data. So there are a few data like SNPP, NOAA, Aqua, Terra, which orbiting Earth twice a day for early detections of any transboundary haze event. So, uh, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like also to tell that uh, the good networking between the agency like the Departments of Meteorological Malaysia or Met Malaysia also assist the Departments of Environment in monitoring the haze conditions in the country by channeling the information on daily weather reports or any hot uh, weather status notifications of the number of days without rain, and of course, the fire danger rating system information, just to monitor the fire risk areas during hot and dry weather. So those are the information related to the uh, air quality uh, measurements of approaches in the country. So uh, when you look at this, right, though we are saying about the um, API, but this is the annual average concentrations of PM10 from 2010 to 2023. From the line chart, we can see that the improvement of air quality as indicated by the PM10 presentation, it has shown some deterioration at the peak of 2015, but in overall, it remained almost constant uh, by virtue of 20 to 25 microgram per meter cubic from 2018 to 2023. So except uh, if for the 2015, the annual average concentrations of PM10 in the country is around 53 micro microgram per meter cubic, which is 
slightly above the Malaysian ambient air quality standards, 45 microgram per meter cubic. This is for one year averaging time. So let's just see what are the pollutants. Uh, and this is the indications of the slides on average concentrations of the M2.5 uh, from 2018 to 2023. And for everyone uh, information, DOE began monitoring the PM10, uh, PM2.5 at the end of 2017, when we were able to purchase some of the equipment. So from this line chart, we can see that the annual average concentrations of PM2.5 remains below the Malaysia ambient air quality standard, which is 25 milligram uh, per meter cubic. This is for one year averaging time. And this is equivalent to the WHO interim target two standards. And um, we know that uh, we are trying to compare with this WHO interim target three, which we are targeted from 2020 to 2023. So uh, let's go to the other pollutants, the sulfur, uh, the ozone. This is the annual average concentrations of ground level ozone uh, from 2010 to 2023. So we can see that the annual average concentration remains far below the Malaysia ambient air quality standards. Okay. So, so same for the sulfur dioxide, still remains below and as well as the nitrogen uh, dioxide, uh, which I think uh, the Malaysia ambient air quality stated uh, is 0 0.15 ppm. So for the carbon monoxide, uh, this is the annual average concentrations of carbon dioxide from 2010 to 2023. And from the line chart, we can see the annual average concentrations of carbon monoxide remains far below the Malaysia ambient air quality standards, which is 8.7 ppm. So overall, we can see that the, the air quality in Malaysia is remains uh, in a good and moderate uh, status. So Malaysia air quality uh, status for this year alone, I think from January to uh, April 2024, and through the APIMS, uh, APIMS reports that 99% is in the good to moderate status, with 69% in the moderate quality, and we also recorded 30% in the good quality. So the 24-7 API reading can be obtained from the APIMS websites of Departments of Environment Malaysia. Okay, we know that, uh, let's go and see what's the re regulatory framework for Malaysia. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, DOE, uh, is an enforcement agency. So the main role is to prevent, control, abate pollution, and of course, for the enhancement of, of the environment. And this mechanism has been implemented through the enforcement of the Environmental Quality Act 1974 and its subsidiary legislation, where we have many regulation has been promulgated from the agro-based uh, uh, regulations and controlling the air emissions from the stationary or mobile sources, noise from motor vehicles, uh, management of schedules, and in fact, for the enhancement of the environment, we are focusing so much on the approach of environmental impact assessment. And they are also a party, uh, an organization to enforce the protections and preservation of marine environment in the Exclusive Economic Zone uh, uh, Act 1984. So for the clean air requirements, we can see, this is a specific sections in the law. We call it section 22. So there are various uh, regulation has been promulgated from the, the main one is the Environmental Quality Clean Air Regulations 2014. But the other uh, small activities or small sectors, like open burning, control of the motor vehicles, of the petrol and diesel content, the emissions from petrol engines, diesel, up to the 
Talon, which is uh, very much in the, to support the obligation to the Montreal Protocol. So those are the more or less the G's of the regulations that support the clean air requirement for Malaysia. So uh, let's see, I mean, we have a quick uh, look on the what the challenge that we face uh, in the country. So uh, there are four major causes of air pollution that we could identify um, now. I think uh, based on the record that we have, we are having now more than 32 uh, million uh, vehicles uh, on the road. And we know that the transportation emission is one of the air pollution or challenges in Malaysia. And of course, uh, there are also an issue of open burning from the biomass. We have like paddy fields also like local haze has been uh, involved. And of course, uh, some or uh, a pocket uh, landfills burning. Uh, and, and we also have sometimes like uh, issue of having transboundary uh, inform uh, Haze. And uh, the third one uh, that we are concentrating in ensuring that all the industrial emission is still um, comply with the clean air regulations. And the third, uh, the fourth major causes of air pollution is the transboundary haze. And but we know that this depending on the wind directions and the monsoon. And we are working very closely with our neighbor countries in ensuring that uh, this is will be curbed. And we are happy that we have a good uh, collaboration for that. So uh, and let us see what are those challenges in maintaining the good air quality. And I think this is quite general for everyone. Um, in every country in the world, of course, the process of urbanization, which characterized by increased population and density, uh, the industrial activities, vehicular traffic, poses significant challenges to the maintaining good air quality. Uh, and this is one of the focus for us to enhance our enforcement for the vehicular uh, traffic uh, enforcement as well. So the second one that we uh, uh, understand, uh, while we are having a good uh, lifestyle in the country, the waste in adequate waste management practices, uh, maybe improper disposal uh, methods such as open building still occur and this contribute to the air pollution through the release of harmful gases and particulate matter into the atmosphere. So industrial emission, I think um, I could say that uh, in still in control but it's require very stringent regulatory measures for this control and DOE uh, has set up many ways in monitoring this emission through the uh, online or telemetrized uh, detection from each of the industry. Uh, the other part is on the uh, natural resources. Uh, this is like biogenic emissions. But uh, the main part, as I say earlier, the transportation, uh, we have an issue of the challenges of the resource constraints. Uh, we have, though we are quite comfortable with what we have now, but we still have to go the challenges of limited financial resources and technology capabilities to present that present challenges to implementing the effective air quality management strategies. Um, I would like to say that from the 65 um, automatic stations in the country, we believe that we have to put more uh, in those areas, right? And uh, these are the things that we are trying very hard to establish uh, the monitoring and enforcement mechanism in the future. So for the awareness, uh, while we are doing, but we still feel that there are insufficient public awareness and understanding of the sources and impacts of air pollution that hinders us to address the issue of um, tackling all this information and uh, promoting the educational campaigns and outreach initiative is uh, ongoing. And hopefully, in the near future, the incarcerations are uh, to have like to have the behavior change uh, of of those inform uh, practices that might uh, contribute to the air pollution. And last but not least, uh, the policy implementation and enforcement, uh, the challenges in policy implementation and enforcement, including the weak regulatory framework. Uh, 
for the case of Malaysia, it's not with regulatory framework. It's more on the compliance to the regulatory framework that we have uh, promulgated. And um, to mainstreaming or enhance the enforcement mechanism needs more people, more technology, and of course, uh, the issue of institutional capacity constraint that require to enhance the governance and regulatory measure. measure right. So uh, look at the how the operationalize of Malaysia comprehensive uh, plan of action. So over the years, uh, I would like to share that DOE has undertaken a comprehensive measures and actions to address and mitigate uh, the air pollution and also to mitigate uh, through the fire and his situations. So these efforts include the activations of many plans, both uh, the Department's Environment and the Ministry. Currently, we are placed under the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability that emphasizing mitigation, enforcement, and monitoring. So the activation of plan is uh, through uh, promulgated and initiated the activation of standard operating procedure for implementing the peatland fire prevention program uh, to mitigate the local haze. So simultaneously, we have activated the National Open Burning Action Plan for the country. So for the National Haze Action Plan that has been revised in 2018, is to trigger early governmental agencies' interventions since we already put the inclusions of 2. PM 2.5 in Malaysia Air Pollution Index. For the approach of mitigation actions, we are continuously monitoring our air quality status through the EQMP program, which we have 65 automatic air quality stations and three automatic mobile stations. And for Malaysian's government also has expanded the number of patrols and enforcement activities, particularly in the fire prone areas and increase our drone application for monitoring and enforcement purposes. And last but not least, I would like to say that our enforcement uh, has to translate that into the actions of the law. So under the sections, uh, specific sections in the Environmental Quality Act 1974, sec section 29A, individuals responsible for any open burning can face penalties a maximum of 500,000 uh, ringgit or a prison uh, maximum of five years or both, uh, of both. So, uh, we know that we need to have a very good uh, approach in tackling the air pollution or local haze uh, through the smart enforcement practices. Uh, it involves collaborative effort with these uh, other agencies like land and district offices as well as relevant local authorities. So let's see uh, what other approach that we have in Malaysia in terms of the visualizations of the uh, enforcement so uh, or, or the uh, local haze right so malaysia is currently operating 305 check dams uh, we have established or constructed more than 100 tube wells and all those infrastructure uh, together with the piezometer to support the pitland fire prevention program and uh, for the case for continuous emission monitoring system, so this is to enhance the deliberations of the on-ground uh, enforcement where we are introducing a special program, a distance enforcement through the establishment of the continuous emission monitoring system, or we call it CEMS. And the enforcement of the emergency to quality clean air regulation 2014 with more stringent emission limits and the technical requirement to install this CMS. This is to control and monitor the emission compliance of all the industries in almost real time from remote. So again, um, 
we also not to forget the strategic communications and community program. Uh, this SEPA program has been implemented to enhance public engagement and awareness for the protections of peatlands from fires and land deteriorations, as well as for the industrial per se. Uh, there are many programs has been introduced and carried out. This program is very effective in preventing recurrence of fire in specific peatland areas and is able to reduce the time for the fire suppression with the availability of water resources and water peatlands. So while we are concentrating with the peatlands, uh, through the awareness uh, program, the local community has become the ears and eyes of the government agencies. So this active community involvement plays a crucial role in curbing fires and safeguarding the integrity of peatland ecosystem. At the same time, uh, DOE has implemented several awareness programs such as uh, the radio, television announcement, uh, our social media announcement, ed education, talk shows, uh, and the briefings with the fire department on the issue of open burning, and we also disseminate many leaf, uh, leaflets and community programs. Okay, uh, and again, uh, is through the institutional approach, I think more formal one, we had established the National Committee on Haze and Dry Weather Meeting, we chat by the Minister of Natural Resources and Environmental, Environmental Sustainability. Uh, so it convenes at least twice a year and it is required based on circumstances and it has been conveyed and laid to all the state's offices in the country as well. So in the international arena, I think we also participating or in, and had participated in the 18th meeting of the community under the Conference of Parties and the 18th meeting of the Conference of Parties to the ASEAN Agreement on the Transboundary Haze Pollution, COPS 18. And there are also the 24th meeting of Technical Working Group and Sub-Regional Ministerial Steering Committee on Transboundary Haze Pollution. So way forward, I could say that um, the Clean Air Action Plan 2010-2020 20 that has been initiated and been implemented since 2010. It's already expired, but by taking the account of uh, current issues, improving technology and addressing uh, future environmental challenges, DOE has started to initiate a study on the development of the new one, uh, the Clean Air Action Plan up to, we are focusing to 2040, which is tentatively to be published in Q3 of 2024. So uh, in this improved plan, it will consist of six tries, 27 focus areas, 63 strategies, and 153 action plans. The projects and the plans for the improvement of the air quality in Malaysia will um, focusing on the action plan for the management of prone burning peatlands in Malaysia, um, maybe on the program for the prevention of peatland and other prone burn area. And we also to focus on the projects of the establishing the Malaysia Environmental Quality Mon Monitoring Blueprint. Uh, this is to revise and improve the current environmental quality monitoring network stations and all the approaches throughout Malaysia and for the future directions of the uh, air quality monitoring uh, station as well. And the fourth one, we also uh, plans to revise and in the middle of revising and improve the environmental quality clean air regulation. This is for more effective uh, in point source pollution control and to align with the latest technology of the industry. And uh, we are in the middle of developing the guidelines for order pollution control. And of course, uh, we have many industries like uh, raw, palm oils, food processing, and so on. Uh, so those are the countries. But the major parts of the international commitment for Malaysia is 
uh, under the purview of Malaysia's Kigali implementation plan. So this is to control and phase down the use of hydrofluorocarbon and one of the strong GHG control substances under the Montreal Protocol. So I would like very much indeed to share the, uh, the HCFC phase up management plan that has been introduced in Malaysia is to control and phase out the use of hydrochlorofluorocarbon and one of the ozone depleting substances under the Montreal Protocol. And we are in the middle of working very closely with the World Bank in having this uh, project implemented well for the country. So again, uh, the way forward for the air management plan, uh, we would like to have the revisions of the air quality and for the amateur quality management plan, so we can see that uh, this is the journey of the air monitoring or quality management plan or air quality monitoring program for the country uh, by having uh, more stations to be established and contracted in the future. So with that, uh, before I end up, um, to strengthen uh, the partnerships between government agencies, uh, industry and the society is crucial as to achieve a good uh, quality. And we know that uh, this is in line with the tagline of our environment, our shared responsibility. So with that, uh, thank you and hope to have more um, a better uh, air quality for the world and for Malaysia. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Hasni, for your presentation. I'm sure everyone is eager to ask questions, but we will proceed to the next presentation from Ms. Rahmawati and Ms. Oliver Hernandez. Following their presentation, we will have another Q&A session. However, feel free to drop any questions you have in mind in the chat room or in the Q&A uh, feature. Uh, now we'll move to the next presentation from the Jakarta representative. But firstly, I will share my screen first to introduce her. Yeah, so we'll have um, Ms. Rahmawati. Uh, she is currently serving with the Jakarta Environmental Agency for 31 years and is currently in the role of the head of the Environmental Monitoring Subdivisions at the TKI Jakarta Environmental Agency since March 2021. Uh, before her current position, Ms. Rahmawati held a significant roles in the subdivisions of waste management and air pollution monitoring starting in 2015, and she has participated in various environmental management training programs, including those focused on waste management, emission inventory, and the development of strategies and action plans for enhancing urban air quality. So, yeah, without further ado, Ms. Rahmawati, you may begin your presentation. Uh, I will share the screen for Ms. Rahmawati's presentation. Yes. Terima kasih Mbak Talisa. Selamat siang Bapak Ibu semua. Mohon maaf uh, apabila saya menggunakan bahasa Indonesia pada saat ini ya. Karena kita juga ada translator untuk apa bisa menerjemahkan bahasa Indonesia ke dalam bahasa uh, sehari-hari Ibu Bapak. Ya, tadi kalau kita dengarkan uh, pemapar sebelumnya ada Ibu Sari, kemudian Chris, dan Beatrice, begitu ya. Betapa pentingnya uh, pengelolaan data kualitas udara uh, yang uh, dilakukan, yang harus kita lakukan di negara masing-masing maupun kita bisa sharing uh, antar negara. Kalau tadi uh, kita telah mendengarkan Ibu Sari lebih banyak menjelaskan terkait dengan bagaimana pengelolaan uh, udara, kualitas udara di Malaysia. Nah, pada saat ini saya hanya berfokus kepada Jakarta karena memang uh, saya bekerja di uh, DLH Provinsi DKI Jakarta. Jadi uh, saya akan menjelaskan uh, apa yang kita lakukan terhadap data, bagaimana menganalisis dan menyebarkan informasi terhadap kualitas udara di DKI Jakarta. Uh, next slide. 
next. Ya, yeah, uh, Bapak Ibu semuanya, uh, ini lokasi uh, stasiun pemantau kualitas udara di Jakarta. Sebetulnya pemantauan kualitas udara di DKI Jakarta sebelum uh, tahun ini ataupun uh, 10 tahun terakhir kami juga selain stasiun pemantau kualitas udara yang bentuknya kontinu otomatis kami sebetulnya di awal uh, tahun 1900-an gitu ya 1990-an itu kami sudah memulai uh, pemantauan kualitas udara dengan manual. Jadi kami memulai uh, pemantauan di DKI Jakarta ada 11 uh, titik uh, lokasi uh, dengan menggunakan manual yang kita mengukur juga uh, parameter seperti uh, TSP ya, TSP kemudian SO2, NO2, uh, CO bahkan uh, ozon juga uh, kami ukur secara manual pada saat itu. Namun seiring perkembangannya kondisi di internasional, kemudian sejak mungkin sekitar tahun 2010 ya atau 2005 kami sudah tidak menggunakan lagi stasiun pemantauan yang manual. Kemudian kita bergerak ke arah melaksanakan pemantauan kualitas udara dengan secara kontinu ya. Nah kami pada saat ini terus mengembangkan jumlah pemantauan kualitas udara di DKI Jakarta uh, menjadi lebih representatif terhadap kondisi uh, area luas luasan Jakarta. Berdasarkan kajian, sebetulnya kami di Jakarta itu membutuhkan paling tidak 25 stasiun pemantau kualitas udara uh, yang secara uh, metode reference dan juga minimal 44 titik untuk uh, stasiun yang menggunakan loko sensor gitu ya. Namun makin banyak tentu akan lebih representatif terhadap kualitas uh, udara di area Jakarta. Pada saat ini uh, di Jakarta selain punya Pemprov DKI sebetulnya ada juga punya Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup, kemudian ada dari BMKG dan juga dari US Embassy serta ada juga NGO-NGO yang mengukur uh, secara individual uh, kualitas udara di daerah masing-masing. Nah saat ini Pemprov DKI sendiri ada 12 uh, stasiun pemantau kualitas udara yang bertaraf reference dan uh, ada 14 loko sensor. Uh, kami ber, uh, berkolaborasi selain dari Pemprov DKI termasuk WRI juga uh, telah uh, mengukur kualitas udara di Jakarta uh, sebanyak tiga titik ya selebihnya uh, stasiun pemantau kualitas udara lebih banyak dimiliki oleh pemprov dki nah jenis-jenis percemar uh, parameter yang kita ukur ada pm 10 pm dua setengah co ozon so 2 no 2 uh, dan yang terakhir uh, dilakukan oleh uh, wri adalah black carbon yang ditempatkan pada empat uh, stasiun pemantau uh, milik uh, pemprov dki jakarta jadi sejak 2023 kami juga mengukur black carbon di Jakarta. Next slide. Nah, apa yang kita lakukan terhadap data kualitas udara itu sendiri? Jadi hasil pemantauan kualitas udara yang konsentrasi tersebut kita analisis yang terdiri dari mulai dari analisis pemenuhan terhadap baku mutu udara ambient milik uh, pemerintah nasional secara nasional kemudian kita menganalisis juga bagaimana indeks standar pencemar udaranya kemudian kita menganalisis uh, di diurnal kemudian kita analisis juga per musim kemudian analisis uh, perbandingan antar lokasi dan juga menganalisis uh, polar plot selanjutnya nah ini uh, adalah Uh, contoh uh, analisis yang kita lakukan berdasarkan baku mutu udara ambient uh, nasional berdasarkan uh, peraturan pemerintah nomor 22 tahun 2021. Kita bandingkan uh, secara seluruh Jakarta uh, contohnya di slide uh, di apa di grafik yang sebelah kanan itu pada tahun 2022 dan 2023 
uh, untuk uh, PM 2,5 terlihat bahwa uh, dua tahun terakhir ya dua tahun terakhir 2022-2023 itu uh, konsentrasi eh, kualitas udara per bulan rata-rata bulanan di Jakarta itu selalu melebihi uh, baku mutu dan ini menjadi concern kita semua uh, bahwa kualitas udara di Jakarta lumayan uh, tinggi uh, nilainya uh, dan ini uh, menjadi concern kita baik di Jakarta maupun di tingkat nasional. Next. Tadi selain uh, menganalisis secara baku mutu udara ambient uh, yang dimiliki oleh uh, apa, nasional, kita juga menganalisis uh, indeks standar pencemar udara uh, atau uh, air quality index ya. Kalau tadi uh, Ibu Kris menyampaikan, nah ini uh, di Indonesia uh, kita ada peraturannya khusus terkait dengan indeks standar pencemar udara yaitu eh, Permen LH nomor 14 tahun 2020. Di sini memang sedikit berbeda sebetulnya dengan eh, air quality index yang dimiliki oleh eh, negara eh, Amerika begitu ya. Di sini kita ada baik, sedang, eh, tidak sehat, sangat tidak sehat dan berbahaya. Dan ini contoh perhitungan pada grafik sebelah kanan penghitungan uh, analisis indeks standar pencemar udara di tahun 2023 uh, memang secara uh, apa secara analisis ispunya ini terlihat bahwa persentase kategori sedang itu uh, ba lebih banyak dibandingkan dengan konsen uh, dengan kategori baik dan juga uh, tidak sehat ya jadi cenderung uh, konsentrasinya atau indeksnya itu sedang yang uh, secara rentang rentangnya antara 51 hingga 100 uh, pak indeksnya ya dan ini mungkin kebanyakan mungkin lebih dari 50 uh, angkanya indeksnya uh, kecuali di bulan-bulan uh, musim apa hujan ya. Next. Nah, kalau ini adalah uh, analisis di jurnal Bapak Ibu yang uh, kita lakukan, di mana kita um, melihat seluruh lokasi yang kita miliki, kemudian kita lihat secara time series uh, dari waktu ke waktu, uh, jam, kemudian bulan dan juga uh, seluruh lokasi. Di sini terlihat bahwa uh, konsentrasi PM 2,5 per jam selama satu minggu untuk periode Oktober hingga uh, November 2023 di 8 SPKU yang kita miliki. Ini adalah salah satu contoh uh, analisis yang kita lakukan. Next. Kemudian selanjutnya adalah uh, analisis per musim ya. Jadi uh, ini adalah yang di sebelah grafik sebelah kiri contoh rata-rata konsentrasi PM2.5 yang kita bandingkan dengan uh, curah hujan ya di tahun 2023 di mana hujan itu sangat uh, sedikit bulan-bulannya uh, dan musim keringnya jauh lebih banyak, musim panasnya jauh lebih banyak. Di kiri terlihat bahwa uh, konsentrasi PM2,5 pada uh, musim mulai dari April hingga Oktober itu me me menaik ya, uh, mulai uh, terlihat tinggi. Apa apalagi ketika musim hujannya benar-benar uh, tidak ada begitu ya atau bisa dibilang sangat kecil gitu uh, ini sampai nilai konsentrasi dari PM 2,5 setengahnya di bulan uh, mulai dari bulan Juni hingga Oktober itu uh, 
antara 50 ataupun lebih dari 50 mikrogram per meter kubik. Kemudian di sisi kanan pada grafik atau tabel itu terlihat sekali bahwa ketika ini contoh yang kita analisis pada tahun 2021 begitu ya apabila kita lihat kalau hujannya itu hanya sekitar uh, kurang dari berapa ya 50 begitu ya sekitar uh, 16 22 itu ataupun bahkan ini di sisi kanannya itu terlihat kalender uh, PM2,5 itu hanya ada uh, apa ya uh, cenderung warnanya hijau itu di Januari Februari Maret hanya sedikit dan akan ada lagi di bulan November dan Desember. Next, Mbak Alisa. Oke, okay. kemudian ini juga kita lakukan analisis perbandingan antar lokasi ya berdasarkan status mutu. Jadi ya hampir di semua lokasi ya atau di semua lokasi itu sebetulnya status uh, pencemaran itu kategorinya adalah tercemar untuk uh, parameter PM10, PM2,5, uh, ozon dan NO2. Bahkan ada beberapa lokasi itu bahkan SO2 dan juga ozon ya. Uh, ini untuk status mutu uh, status mutu itu kita menggunakan permen uh, lingkungan hidup nomor 12 tahun 2010 uh, tentang pengend uh, pengendalian pencemaran uh, udara di pemerintah daerah ini kemudian kita lihat uh, dan di sana ada uh, cara penghitungannya bagaimana menghitung uh, indeks uh, status mutu tersebut dari uh, baku mutu rata-rata uh, 24 jam dan juga uh, nilai konsentrasi yang kita ukur jam-jaman. Uh, Kemudian kita lihat secara terus-terus uh, menurut satu tahun. Dari satu tahun itu maka bisa dihitung status mutunya seperti apa di setiap uh, lokasi pemantauan. Nah ini uh, pada tahun 2000 23 begitu ya ini terlihat bahwa uh, semua lokasi uh, ini contohnya adalah lima lokasi yang uh, kita miliki stasiun pemantaunya uh, bahwa terlihat bahwa statusnya adalah tercemar uh, next kemudian kita juga uh, melakukan uh, Analisis secara uh, spasial uh, ini kelihatan sekali bahwa makin uh, musim hujan, ya, musim hujannya makin uh, ada, gitu ya, uh, makin terlihat uh, kemerahan. Ya, kalau di Januari, Februari uh, banyak hijaunya, uh, mulai Maret itu mulai ada orange-orange, ya, peningkatan nilai konsentrasi dari pencemar PM2,5, bahkan di bulan Juli itu makin merah sekali yang menandakan bahwa konsentrasi di bulan Juli di semua titik itu sangat tinggi, bahkan nilainya di atas 55 mikrogram per meter kubik pada bulan Juli. Jadi terlihat sekali pada bulan Juli di tahun kemarin itu di seluruh lokasi yang kita miliki itu sudah di atas uh, 55 mikrogram per meter kubik. Next. Nah selain yang uh, tadi saya sampaikan, kita juga melakukan analisis secara polar plot ya. Bapak Ibu, ini contohnya yang kita lakukan polar plot pada stasiun pemantau kualitas udara di Tamrin di DKI 1. Ini secara apa? Secara sistem kita bisa melakukan ini juga ya dengan rata-rata PM dua setengah yang kita lakukan. 
Kemudian kita juga melakukan analisis polar plot um, dengan melihat uh, tata guna lahan. Di sini kita lihat uh, bagaimana di DKI 1 itu uh, ke, apabila kepadatan jalannya tinggi um, uh, dan juga uh, apa uh, ada uh, kita bandingkan juga dengan uh, tata guna lahannya itu terlihat sekali bahwa uh, stasiun pemantau kita uh, uh, terukur uh, sangat tinggi. Uh, next. Kemudian dari hasil analisis tersebut, bagaimana kita menginformasikan uh, hasil data pemantauan kualitas udara yang kita miliki. Uh, next, Mbak Kalisa. Nah, ini kita menyampaikan kepada masyarakat uh, informasi kualitas udaranya itu ada beberapa laman atau situs baik di aplikasi Jaki ataupun di situs uh, website uh, kami di DLH. Namun juga kita juga uh, menyampaikan seluruh stasiun pemantau kualitas udara yang kita miliki dengan Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup. Jadi selain di Pemprov DKI Jakarta, data juga kita kirim kepada Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup sehingga datanya bisa diakses uh, di seluruh Indonesia uh, yang ter, uh, apa, terkoneksi dengan uh, jaringan ataupun stasiun milik uh, Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup. Ini adalah uh, salah, salah satu contoh informasi yang kita sampaikan. Selain itu, next. Dan juga kita juga menyampaikan kepada masyarakat informasi kualitas udara ataupun apapun terkait dengan udara itu melalui media sosial. Entah itu Instagram ataupun media sosial lainnya termasuk eh, apa media sosial yang ada di milik eh, apa umum gitu ya, koran ataupun situs eh, website dari eh, milik umum. Ini kita bisa menyebarkan luas eh, apa luas eh, terkait dengan kualitas udara. Contohnya di sebelah kiri di balik langit biru Jakarta seperti apa sampai dengan apa itu stasiun pemantau kualitas udara eh, supaya masyarakat itu bisa memahami apa sih eh, pemantau kualitas udara dan bagaimana cara eh, mengukurnya. Kita juga menginformasikannya kepada masyarakat. Next, ya yeah. mungkin uh, itu saja yang bisa saya sampaikan. Uh, Mudah-mudahan informasi yang saya sampaikan pada uh, sharing community praktis uh, hari ini bisa bermanfaat untuk semua. Terima kasih. Ya, terima kasih banyak Bu untuk presentasinya. Uh, what an insightful presentations. Uh, I would like to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please drop it in the chat room. As now, we will begin the last presentation from the Mexico City representative. Uh, I will share my screen to first introduce Ms. Olivia. So now for our last uh, speaker, we will have Ms. Olivia Rivera Hernandez. Uh, she's from CC Air Quality Monitoring Director of Mexico City. Uh, she has experience in air quality monitoring began in 1994 in the state of Morelos, where she designed and implemented the first network for monitoring atmospheric pollutants and carried out the first step inventory of emission sources. And in 2000, she joined the Ministry of the Environment of the government of Mexico City in the atmospheric monitoring system. And since then, since then she has worked in key areas related to quality control and assurance, design and operation of air monitoring, atmospheric deposition, and meteorology networks. And at the same time, Olivia is responsible for the analysis, validation, and computer system for the dissemination of the data. And since 2017, she has assumed the role as the director of air quality monitoring. So, without further ado, uh, Ms. Olivia, over to you. Hola, buenas noches a todos. Y gracias por la invitación a participar. Este, es un gusto desde aquí, desde Ciudad de México, poder estar con ustedes. 
Y bueno, pues también es de hablar sobre la experiencia que tenemos nosotros en la difusión de la información de calidad del aire. Eh, ¿Presentan ustedes o presento yo? Uh, you can share your presentation. Ok, gracias. Listo. Este, les voy a hablar sobre nuestra experiencia para poder difundir los datos de calidad del aire, ponerlos a disposición de la población aquí en, México, en Ciudad de México. Este, nuestro sistema de monitoreo atmosférico cuenta con 44 estaciones de monitoreo en donde se miden, al igual que este, en las presentaciones anteriores, los contaminantes criterio, que son este, parte de los que también este, regula las guías de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, como es el ozono, el dióxido de nitrógeno, el dióxido de azufre, el monóxido de carbono, las partículas menores a 10 y 2.5 micrómetros. Y de manera automática también medimos este, lo que son variables meteorológicas, temperatura, humedad relativa, velocidad, dirección de viento, presión barométrica. Este, también tenemos colección de muestras de partículas en los tamaños de partículas suspendidas totales, partículas menores a 10 micrómetros y 2.5 micrómetros. Y también tenemos una red de 16 estaciones donde se mide el depósito atmosférico para ver el impacto en el suelo de conservación por la contaminación de la ciudad y también la que llega de otros lados. Este, la el contenido de esta presentación es bueno hablarles de cómo difundimos el índice de calidad del aire ¿no? Este, cómo hacemos nuestras alertas este, con respecto a los niveles elevados este, y estas alertas, eh, como, bajo qué situaciones se están dando y también lo que, son las, lo que le llamamos nosotros las contingencias ambientales atmosféricas y también cómo difundimos nuestro pronóstico de calidad del aire. Finalmente, toda la información que se genera en el sistema de monitor atmosférico se sumariza en un reporte anual este, de calidad del aire y también este, seguimos los protocolos de lo que es nuestro programa de gestión ambiental para la Ciudad de México y para la zona metropolitana. Eh, déjenme decirles que en el caso de este, la Ciudad de México tiene un área muy extensa conurbada que pertenece a otro estado y bueno, somos alrededor de 21 millones de habitantes en esta área extensa. El monitor atmosférico pues es básicamente lo que ya presentaron mis colegas este, anteriores. Tenemos una caseta de monitoreo. Eh, la información fluye a través de un sistema adquisidor de datos, que es un data logger, y de ahí pasa a lo que es nuestra nube de cómputo para poder ser procesado, analizado, este, trabajado y finalmente difundido hacia la población. Así es como básicamente funcionan este, los sistemas de monitoreo y como básicamente también se difunde la información. ¿no? Esta nube de cómputo también almacena la información de los datos este, que se muestran. ¿no? Y después, una vez que ya tenemos la información en esa nube de cómputo, ¿cómo la procesamos para poderla publicar a través de nuestro sitio web, de la página aire.cdmx.gov.mx y a través de nuestra aplicación Aire? Entonces, este lleva una serie de procesos de validaciones y de difusión para, para la información que se brinda a la población. Y es importante para nosotros tenerla poderla hacer de manera continua y de manera expedita también. Eh, tenemos básicamente un tiempo de, de, res, de retardo en lo que se termina la hora, en el momento en que sale la difusión del índice de calidad del aire, de cinco minutos, ya con una información prevalidada gracias al sistema que tenemos para, el sistema electrónico que tenemos para lo que es la prevalidación de la información. ¿no? Estamos sacando información a público, Básicamente con un 80% de confiabilidad y esta información es la que se da en el índice de calidad del aire y posteriormente esta información puede sufrir otra, bueno, pasa a otras etapas de validación y, puede, y podemos modificar 
esa información. ¿Por qué? Pues porque se determina que el dato que llegó en ese momento este, eh, no estaba cumpliendo con las características y con la calidad que tenía que haber salido y entonces se puede eliminar ese dato y entonces puede cambiar este, al final del mes la información que nosotros brindamos a la población. Pero bueno, este, también tiene un gran asertividad la información que estamos dando hora con hora. ¿No? Difundimos en plataformas este, de Android, de Apple y Huawei también la información de, este, de la índice de calidad del aire a través de nuestra aplicación. Esta es nuestra página. Nuestra página contiene lo que es la información del índice para cada una de las estaciones de monitoreo. Eh, damos también el índice de radiación solar. Este es importante para nosotros. ¿Por qué? Porque estamos a, a 2.240 metros sobre el nivel del mar aproximadamente y tenemos una gran incidencia de radiación solar. En los últimos años, eh, debido a que las concentraciones de los contaminantes han disminuido, se ha incrementado la incidencia de radiación solar y también se ha incrementado los, eh, este, el número de población que tiene cáncer de piel aquí en México. Eh, hacemos publicación en nuestra red social que es, que es EX y también este, damos atención y difusión de la calidad del aire a través de nuestra línea telefónica este, que tenemos habilitada, ¿no?, eh, esta línea telefónica también es importante para nosotros porque hay gente que no entiende cómo es el índice de calidad del aire o qué les quiere decir el índice de calidad del aire y a través de esta línea telefónica podemos conversar con ellos para darles una mayor explicación. Dado que tenemos datos horarios, es, te podemos dar alertas a nuestra población. Es importante que la población se encuentre informada en todo momento de lo que pasa con este, la calidad del aire. ¿no? Estas alertas son eventos extraordinarios causados por actividades antropogénicas o eventos naturales, los cuales eh, se pueden presentar por un par de horas únicamente o pueden este, deberse al, a... Este, a lo que le llamamos nosotros este, fenómenos inéditos, ¿no? Y que no llegan a un valor de contingencia. Los valores de contingencia los vamos a ver más adelante, pero bueno, es importante que estas alertas también se le puedan difundir a la población. Nosotros estamos este, cerca o tenemos cerca un volcán y este volcán... <risa> Perdón. Y este volcán... <risa> está continuamente <coughs> echando ceniza, entonces, permítame tantito, déjame tomar agua. Ya, listo. Este, el volcán está continuamente echando ceniza y esa ceniza en ocasiones llega a lo que es la Ciudad de México. Por eso también es importante alertar a la población sobre eh, de los cuidados que tienen que tener cuando ocurre esta ceniza, ¿no? ¿Cómo es que la alertamos? La alertamos a través de nuestra red social, a través de nuestra aplicación y, y de manera interna alertamos también a los tomadores de decisiones sobre lo que está pasando para que también ellos a su vez activen protocolos en caso de que tengan que, que hacerlo. ¿no? En el caso de las contingencias ambientales, estas están topadas por un valor. En el, este, tenemos contingencias ambientales por ozono y tenemos contingencias ambientales por PM10 y PM2.5. El ozono es uno de los contaminantes que tiene una mayor presencia aquí en Ciudad de México. Estamos en una cuenca en donde las concentraciones de los contaminantes se estancan. Y bueno, da tiempo con la intensa radiación solar que tenemos a que los precursores se transformen en, es, en ozono. Y ahorita, con la alta radiación que tenemos, porque estamos nosotros en, nuestra, en, en primavera, tenemos temperaturas de 34 grados Celsius, pues bueno, tenemos también altas concentraciones de ozono. Y continuamente en esta temporada estamos declarando contingencias ambientales. Estas contingencias ambientales igual son eventos extraordinarios, estos son temporales, pero son declarados por la autoridad y tiene restricciones tanto para la población como para la industria, 
y los servicios, ¿no? Este, y se tienen que acatar cuando estas restricciones no son acatadas, bueno, pues hay una sanción hacia, hacia ellos, ¿no? Eh, las contingencias se reportan por diferentes medios. Este, las reportamos a través de nuestras redes sociales, las reportamos a través de radio, de televisión, este, todos los medios este, masivos que conocemos. O este, y también eh, telefónicamente alertamos a las autoridades que tienen que ejercer acciones eh, particulares durante la contingencia ambiental. Por ejemplo, este, tránsito tiene que agilizar la movilidad de los vehículos durante una contingencia ambiental. Este, hay patrullas ecológicas las cuales detienen a los vehículos que son ostensiblemente contaminantes. Entonces, bueno, pues es importante alertar a todo el mundo cuando tenemos una contingencia ambiental para que también ellos puedan aplicar sus actividades. Este, cada año nosotros publicamos un reporte anual de calidad del aire. Este resume cómo estuvo la tendencia de los contaminantes a lo largo del año, a qué se debió esta contaminación de acuerdo a las condiciones meteorológicas y también los otros parámetros que medimos. Este, ponemos los principales indicadores estadísticos para poder comparar año con año, vemos lo que son las tendencias y también algo muy importante es el apartado en donde decimos ¿Qué es lo que ocurrió con la operación de la red de monitoreo? ¿Por qué? Porque cuando descargan las bases de datos, si ven un periodo largo de falta de información en alguna de nuestras estaciones de monitoreo, a través de este informe pueden saber por qué la estación de monitoreo estuvo fuera durante ese periodo. Y esto se puede deber pues, a, a, este, a, a fallas en el suministro eléctrico, este, que hayan estado haciendo actividades de asfaltado o una construcción cerca de la estación de monitoreo, lo cual impidió que pudiéramos nosotros reportar esos datos este, o falta de refacciones también para la operación de los equipos. Perdón. En esta sección también podemos este, encontrar lo que es nuestro programa de calidad del aire, nuestro programa de gestión de calidad del aire. Todas las acciones que llevamos a cabo como monitoreo de calidad del aire están avaladas dentro de nuestro programa de gestión de la calidad del aire, el cual es 2021-2030, en donde tenemos que difundir continuamente la información de calidad del aire, tenemos que hacer uso de tecnologías este, no reguladas, como son los sensores de bajo costo o información satelital, y pues bueno, nos apegamos a, a nuestro programa de calidad del aire. Perdón. En el caso de, este, de nuestro pronóstico de calidad del aire, esto lo difundimos para el día de hoy y el día de mañana, es a 24 y 48 horas. Difundimos el valor máximo esperado en cada una de las estaciones de monitoreo. Y este con el fin de que la población sepa cómo va a estar la calidad del aire en la zona donde se encuentra. Eh, México tiene un problema de obesidad. Somos el país que tiene mayor obesidad en el mundo. Y pues de alguna manera lo que no queremos es recluir a las personas en sus casas y que no salgan a hacer ejercicio o que los niños no salgan a hacer ejercicio. Por eso es importante decirles cómo va a estar la calidad del aire en la zona donde se encuentran para que ellos puedan, puedan planear sus actividades. Este, perdón, déjenme tomar algo otra vez. Hay una disculpa. Este, nuestro sitio de monitoreo, aparte de difundir el índice de calidad del aire, también de información sobre este, la temperatura, qué vehículos tienen una restricción, y tenemos también nuestra plataforma social, EX, ¿no? Este, 
dentro de la información que tenemos en nuestra página de internet, para nosotros es importante poner notas relevantes. Ahorita, como les comentaba, estamos en temporada de ozono y pues tenemos información sobre qué es el ozono, cómo se forma, cuáles son las medidas para la población que tiene que acatar para su protección este, y el pronóstico de calidad del aire. ¿no? Estas notas van cambiando a lo largo del tiempo. Tenemos una sección de niños en donde les explicamos qué es la contaminación, cómo tienen que interpretar la calidad del aire a través del índice de calidad del aire, este, la radiación solar, cómo se pueden proteger a los rayos solares. Entonces, bueno, tenemos este, nuestro apartado de, de niños en nuestra página de internet. Tenemos lo que es nuestra mascota. Nuestra mascota es un teporingo, es este... Un, un, una especie de conejo pequeño que se encuentra cerca de las laderas de las de los montañas que están aquí en la Ciudad de México. Y pues bueno, él es nuestra mascota. Y pues bueno, en, la, en, la pleca, en las plecas que nosotros este, tenemos de información, es, la gente puede consultar qué son los contaminantes que medimos, cómo se forman o quiénes los emiten, tenemos información sobre el inventario de emisiones para que sepan cuáles son los sectores más contaminantes. Este, tenemos información sobre cuáles son, dónde se generan los contaminantes. Tenemos el, a través del inventario de emisiones. Este, tenemos toda nuestra regulación para operar el sistema de monitor atmosférico. Este, bueno, tenemos los datos de calidad del aire. Nosotros operamos de manera continua desde 1986 y todos los datos horarios pueden ser descargados en esta página desde entonces, desde, desde esa fecha. Tenemos publicaciones y estas publicaciones tienen que ver con la información que, que utilizan este, los científicos o, la gen, o los estudiantes para poder hacer sus investigaciones. Este, ¿En dónde están utilizando información del sistema de monitoreo atmosférico? Este, tenemos nuestra estadística y en esas estadísticas tenemos los principales indicadores de calidad del aire para poder conocer las tendencias desde 1990 hasta la fecha de los, de los contaminantes criterio. ¿No? Y pues bueno... Comentarle que esto no sería posible si no tuviéramos este, un sistema de información este, pues actualizado. ¿no? Tenemos un centro de datos con varios servidores y también tenemos un equipo de, este, de soporte técnico, un equipo de desarrollo, de diseño este, web y también este, diseñadores este, gráficos para poder hacer los, los boletines y también poder hacer los, la impresión de los documentos de calidad del aire. Y pues bueno, es toda mi presentación. Muchas gracias y una disculpa por la tos que me dio. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Olympia, for your for your presentation and thank you to all three city representatives for your insightful presentations. Now uh, let's begin the Q&A session. I would like to remind everyone that if you have any questions please feel free to write it in the Q&A uh, feature or use the chat room. Well, while we're waiting for the questions, um, maybe I have a few questions for our speakers today. So after listening to the recent presentation, I'm curious about uh, what are the challenges in analyzing and interpreting the data? How is collaboration with researchers or other parties conducted in performing analysis and interpretation, especially when there are differences in interpretation results among parties? Perhaps I can ask Dr. Norhasli first to answer the question. Uh, uh, thank you, Kalisha, for the questions, but uh, I hardly can hear what's the real questions but if i could get some of the gist of your questions is related to the uh how do interpret the results right from the uh analysis 
and what kind yes. of data that need to support and interpret data, right? If I, if uh, I right. Recall. Okay. So yes. I think, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, okay, to effectively yeah. interpret the data, uh, obtain from the analysis of equality is crucial. I mean, to consider several factors. Uh, I believe from our MD quality monitoring program uh, of air quality, uh, uh, we have to understand on the methodology use in collecting the data. This is very important. And of course, I think from the Mexico presentation is already outlaid uh, the context of, of uh, deri deriving the result where from the collections of the data, what are the technology or methodology of collecting the data and finally, in terms of uh, where the data has been put, and finally, how it's been turned into a re reporting of the data. So I think the flow that has been presented by Mexico is more or less the same as what in Malaysia. So this is very crucial. So additionally, uh, for that matter, when we're talking about the supporting data on th in terms of methodology, maybe uh, the meteorological conditions is very important. By virtue of temperature, wind, uh, speed of humidity, humidity during the sampling period, uh, this is could be uh, giving some aids in for us to understand uh, the variations in the air quality per se and why its results, uh, why the result is like that. So, furthermore, uh, uh, the data of uh, pollutant emissions, particularly when we want to track on the historical data. And the land use patent can provide more valuable insight into the long-term trends and potential sources of pollution. So lastly, I think by incorporating the data from other monitoring stations or complementary data sets, like we have a lot of uh, issue and, and presentation just now uh, from the satellite imagery, probably can offer more comprehensive understanding of this regional air quality as well as the local uh, dynamics. So again, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, by integrating all these various sources of information, I think what has been said by Madam Chris and all the other speakers, uh, the various sources of information uh, can make us more understand and the stakeholders also can make informed decision and develop more effective strategies for our air quality management. I hope I can answer that. Uh, your questions, uh, Kalisha? Yes, thank you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Rahasi. Uh, perhaps over to uh, Bu Rahmawati to answer the questions on what are the challenges in analyzing and interpreting the data. Ya, yeah. terima kasih, Mbak Kalisa. <laughs> Jadi sebetulnya ketika kita mau menganalisis data, uh, salah satu tantangan ketika data itu hilang, ya. Yeah tahu tahu uh, apa mungkin mati listrik gitu ya. uh, itu yang pertama jadi <tuh> uh, ataupun jaringan internet karena semua kita uh, pakai uh, apa sistemnya itu uh, komunikasi by internet uh, misalnya hilang ya uh, itu juga uh, apa bisa menjadi satu kendala kemudian yang berikutnya uh, ketika uh, uh, apa di di, di dekat eh, stasiun pemantau itu eh, terjadi eh, apa ya sumber yang tidak terduga atau kondisional ya. eh, pada saat misalnya tahu-tahu ada apa ya pembakaran eh, sampah yang tiba-tiba eh, eh, di malam hari begitu atau sumber-sumber eh, lain yang kami sebetulnya tidak eh, bisa menduga eh, di situ ada eh, sumber pencemar tersebut gitu tapi tapi ada mungkin uh, pada saat malam hari begitu di dekat-dekat stasiun yang kita tidak bisa lihat direct langsung ke lapangan gitu ya. Tapi ketika kita melihat uh, di hari berikutnya itu sudah tidak terlihat uh, ada apa-apa lagi tapi nilai konsentrasi di di apa di alat itu menunjukkan tinggi. Itu juga menjadi salah satu tantangan saya rasa yang kita hadapi untuk menganalisis sebetulnya data ini data yang real, real kah atau atau apa begitu ya. Ini yang mungkin kendala-kendala uh, yang kita hadapi uh, di lapangan di mana stasiun pemantau itu tidak kita lihat atau kita tidak duduk 
di stasiun pemantau tersebut uh, 24 jam. Jadi hal-hal itu yang mungkin kadang-kadang bisa uh, menjadi kendala untuk kita menganalisis lebih dalam uh, dan lebih detail lagi. Uh, mungkin begitu Mbak Kalisa, terima kasih. Ya, terima kasih Bu Wai untuk jawabannya. Uh, maybe moving on to Olivia, we would like to know what are the challenges in Mexico City uh, when analyzing or interpreting the data? Este, como ya mencionaron las ponentes anteriores, eh, no podemos estar en las estaciones de monitoreo, pero los equipos sí detectan que algo ocurre en ese momento y esos datos no pueden pasar a, este, a la siguiente etapa, o sea, difundirse a la población. Esos datos tienen que ser retirados. Este, nuestra normatividad dice que tenemos que cumplir con una suficiencia del 75% de la información. Realmente es complicado poderla cumplir cuando tenemos fallas eléctricas, cuando tenemos eh, problemas en los instrumentos, cuando este, las se hacen las verificaciones y las calibraciones de los mismos equipos. En, donde ese, en ese periodo de tiempo en donde se están realizando las actividades, la información se tiene que ir, ¿no? Pero también algo a lo que nos enfrentamos mucho es que cuando nosotros hacemos el cálculo de los indicadores y los presentamos a la, a la población y este, lo presentamos en, en diferentes foros y nos damos cuenta que algunas personas este, presentan también sus propios indicadores utilizando los datos de la red de monitoreo, no tienen el cuidado de, poder, de hacer esta validación como la hacemos nosotros, retirar esos datos que son este, er, o que se ven este, atípicos o no cumplen con la suficiencia de información. Por ejemplo, me, me ha tocado ver que hacen el cálculo de un promedio anual del contaminante utilizando nada más el 30% de los datos del año. Eso no es posible porque tienen información muy sesgada, ¿no? El ozono se presenta, en el caso de Ciudad de México, durante los meses este, más calurosos, que es de marzo a junio, y, este, y el resto del tiempo, bueno, pues el ozono está en, en, en rangos aceptables. Sin embargo, este, nos damos cuenta que ellos toman, por ejemplo, nada más el periodo de valores más altos y con eso hacen el promedio y entonces dicen que nosotros somos los que estamos viendo mal y ocultando la información, ¿no? Entonces es algo que nos, nos enfrentamos de repente con, con esto. Eh, al, y para poderlo solventar, dentro de la página pusimos una sección en donde se pueden hacer consultas a través de estos indicadores. Si ellos quisieran conocer el promedio anual del contaminante, este ya se los damos. Y es el mismo que nosotros también publicamos este, en los foros para no estar duplicando información o que la información se contraponga. ¿no? Eso es importante para, para nosotros. Y pues bueno, los retos que tenemos y del trabajo que tenemos con la, este, con la academia es importante porque los sistemas de monitoreo eh, nos dedicamos más a la operación de los instrumentos y a la y al medir lo que son los contaminantes criterio, ¿no? Pero la academia nos ayuda a saber cuáles son estos compuestos dentro de la ciudad que están formando estos contaminantes secundarios, principalmente los son las partículas finas, ¿no? Si podemos identificar a través de estos estudios eh, las fuentes de emisión, podemos implementar regulación que ayude a bajar las, las emisiones y con ello hacer que haya una incidencia en las concentraciones de calidad del aire, ¿no? Por eso es importante el trabajo que tenemos con la, con la academia, ¿no? Yo creo que Ciudad de México se distingue este, mucho por, el, por estar abierto a, a todo este tipo de investigaciones. Eh, los investigadores también lo reconocen, eh, de alguna manera ellos saben que Tener un equipo de monitores es costoso y se apoyan en nosotros para poder hacer los monitoreos mientras ellos hacen la interpretación y la investigación. ¿no? Gracias. Okay, thank you, Olivia, and thank you, uh, Dr. Rahasmi and Ramawati, for answering the questions. Uh, moving on, we have questions from Betis. Uh, this is specifically for Olivia. So, could you comment about your experiences in making data available to everyone, be it historical and validated data, in increasing awareness of air quality? How the analysis being done by others could help? Uh, 
Este, bueno, básicamente la información la tenemos, nada más es poner la disposición en nuestra página web. Es, usted la, la pueden descargar, tenemos información desde 1986 eh, para todos los contaminantes que se miden. Eh, tenemos un apartado también en, en las descargas en donde decimos a lo largo del tiempo qué estaciones se han ido integrando y se han ido sumando al sistema de monitoreo al mismo tiempo que qué estaciones se han retirado del sistema de monitoreo. ¿Por qué? Por no cumplir con la representatividad. Porque en el espacio a lo mejor donde tenemos ubicada la estación de monitoreo eh, decidieron hacer una construcción y, este, y bueno, pues nos pidieron el... El, el, el sitio, entonces tuvimos que retirar nuestra estación de monitoreo. También este, Ciudad de México tiene terremotos y en el último terremoto ocurrido en, en el 2017, los inmuebles donde estaban dos de nuestras estaciones de monitoreo sufrieron daños. Entonces tuvimos que reubicar en otro, estación, en otro lugar nuestras estaciones de monitoreo. Es importante que también la, eh, cada vez que descargan la información tengan todos, todos estos datos a la mano por si este, detectan anomalidades o de repente ya se cortó la, la tendencia de una estación. ¿no? Pero este, digo, es, es simplemente tener las bases públicas arriba. ¿no? Thank you, Olivia. Uh, Beatrice, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, we will... Beatrice also has a question to Ms. Rahmawati. So, in addition to the correlation analysis between concentration and rain intensity, have you observed other type of correlation with wind speed or wind direction? Ms. Rahmawati, if you please. Ya, yeah. <tuh> terima kasih Beatrice atas pertanyaannya. Uh, tentu saja, jadi uh, karena arah angin dan kecepatan angin itu juga <tuh> dapat uh, memperlihatkan sebetulnya sejauh mana dan dari mana uh, pencemar itu terjadi. Itu juga kita lakukan uh, apa uh, analisis uh, tersebut selain curah hujan. Seluruh uh, pemantauan yang kita lakukan uh, setiap tahun itu Datanya kami apa sampaikan di website, jadi laporan lengkap setiap tahun itu juga kami sediakan. Jadi bagi teman-teman uh, uh, researcher dan juga um, uh, apa, uh, NGO ataupun dari internasional bisa mengunduh secara uh, langsung laporan-laporan uh, kami beserta analisis yang sudah uh, kita lakukan. Demikian Mbak. Terima kasih Beatrice. Yes, terima kasih, Bu Wei. Uh, another question from Beatrice uh, for Dr. Norhasi. So, seeing that you are already complying to your current PM 2.5 standard, are there any plans to update or make a more stringent PM 2.5 standard? Uh, yes, I think as we already responding to the uh, annual average concentrations of PM 2.5 uh, from 2018 to 2023. So basically now we are uh, remain uh, to comply to the average of uh, 2035. But uh, the anticipation to comply with the target uh, WHO target three, which is 15, uh, now uh, we are in the middle of revising uh, the standards, which uh, Malaysia should comply the target from 2020 to 2020-2030, uh, uh, where the anticipations of the microgram will be put uh, to the 50 microgram. Uh, we are in the middle for, the, uh, for information. We are in the middle of having a, a big uh, and many consultation with the stakeholders, particularly the academics, as well as the industries, for us to put these uh, stringent uh, standards in place uh, with uh, target by hopefully to be put into the um, 
ministry management decision by this year. So hopefully uh, by 2030, uh, the improvement to target the 15 micrograms per meter cubic for one year averaging time will be in place. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hashmi, for your answer. At least I hope uh, it answers your questions. Uh, as for now, yeah, we have Muti. Uh, Muti, you can uh, open your mic to ask questions. All right, thank you, Kalisha. Hi, everyone. I'm Muti from Clean Air Catalyst, Jakarta. This question is for uh, every panelist. Uh, so for Olivia, for Burahmawati, and for Dr. Noor. Um, I'm curious, of, uh, do you have any experience in engaging grassroots communities or grassroots stakeholders in addressing air quality concerns? particularly air quality monitoring and decision-making processes pertaining to that. And yeah, that's from me. Thank you. Uh, I think, can I answer first that question? Yes, indeed. Yes. We have a lot of, for Malaysia, we used to face a lot of levels of community from the academicians up to the general community but most of them uh, are from the general community per se, in the sense that there are lots of complaints lodged to us in terms of the real pollution uh, occurrence or incidents. And with that matter, they want to understand about the data uh, that uh, result from this pollution. Uh, it is very much indeed during uh, any issues of um, complaint lodged on the open burnings at the landfill per se, or any open buildings between uh, disputes of neighbors uh, or, or uh, settlements area. And we also have a lot of um, issues to deal with when we have these uh, haze uh, incidents in the country. Uh, either it's a local haze or the uh, transboundary haze. And in fact, uh, I would like to tell everyone up to Malaysia, the incarcerations of this awareness has been in place whereby during the his episode, we always have a lot of um, information or so telephone uh, uh, conversations to the office from the students, uh, hoping that the, the, the school can be closed mm -hmm. at a certain IPU standards or level. So um, in general, I think since uh, uh, DOE has many DOE states in Malaysia, so all of the officers uh, has to go on ground and that's when we need this information to the general public and we respond to them uh, in according to what they're being uh, put forward to us. Uh, I would like to say also this, the, the, the mechanism of lodging or consulting uh, this information is through our online mechanism. We have the e one where it's a online complaint or any uh, online uh, question to be posed in, for, uh, uh, through the uh, websites of DOE as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harasi. Maybe we can have uh, Ms. Rahmawati to answer the question from me. Mm -hmm. Ya, yeah. terima kasih uh, Mbak Muti ya atas pertanyaannya. Uh, ya, yeah. jadi kita kalau di Pemprov DKI Jakarta kita ada uh, apa ya platform platform kolaborasi sosial berskala uh, besar gitu ya. Jadi uh, platform ini digunakan oleh Pemprov atau dibangun untuk Uh, menyatukan berbagai elemen mulai dari akademisi, NGO bahkan uh, masyarakat umum jika ingin uh, apa berkolaborasi dengan pemprov DKI untuk uh, persampahan, sektor persampahan, kemudian sektor udara dan air serta sektor uh, satunya lagi uh, perubahan iklim. Nah ini yang dengan uh, PSBB ini kolaborasi sosial berskala besar ini kita harapkan kita bisa 
apa menyatukan seluruh elemen untuk meningkatkan kualitas lingkungan dari tiga sektor tersebut gitu dan salah satu yang apa sudah join tentu WRI dan apa akademisi juga tentu banyak yang join kemudian tadi selain KSBB tentu seperti yang Bu Nur Afni sampaikan juga di Jakarta juga kita apabila ada uh, pencemaran di salah satu lokasi begitu baik entah itu dari sektor sampah ataupun yang lainnya uh, pembakaran sampah contohnya yang bisa menimbulkan kualitas udara menjadi buruk itu kita ada platform di Jaki kemudian kita juga ada platform uh, apa CRM dari uh, masyarakat bisa langsung uh, klik, bisa langsung uh, melakukan pengaduan uh, apabila ada pencemaran di lokasi masyarakat itu sendiri. Uh, ini mohon maaf karena di samping rumah ada masjid, jadi uh, apa sedikit uh, noisy. Kemudian uh, dari situ kita bisa uh, langsung uh, apa uh, turun ke lapangan dari sektor uh, apa mulai dari kelurahan. Kecamatan hingga dinas-dinas terkait bisa menyelesaikan permasalahan di lapangan secara langsung karena pengaduan yang dilakukan oleh masyarakat terhadap kondisi di lingkungan seluruh lingkungan di Jakarta di lokasinya itu kita juga pe, apa ya penanganan dari pengaduan itu langsung dimonitor oleh Pak Gubernur demikian Mbak. Ya, terima kasih Bu Wei. Uh, maybe for the last answer from Polisia. Este, sí, gracias. Eh, nosotros trabajamos de la mano con la Secretaría de Salud y este, a través de los comités intersectoriales de promoción a la salud eh, llegamos a la población para poder desde incidir en las actividades que realizan ellos y mitigar este, las emisiones de los contaminantes. ¿no? Eh, de todas maneras, como comenté, tenemos también una línea abierta para poder atender a la población si tienen dudas. Tenemos un correo electrónico en donde también este, nos hacen preguntas y contestamos a través de correo electrónico. Eh, Trabajamos en diferentes comités dentro del gobierno de la Ciudad de México, además del comité que tenemos con la Secretaría de Salud, trabajamos también en el Comité de Educación Pública para poder este, incidir también en los escolares sobre este, qué pueden hacer ellos desde sus casas para mejorar eh, la contaminación atmosférica, ¿no? esta eh, reducción de emisiones de contaminantes. Eh, cabe señalar que en Ciudad de México algo, un, est un estudio que hubo hace aproximadamente cinco años demostró que hay muchas fugas de gas al interior de las viviendas, en los calentadores este, de, de baño para este, bañarnos y también en las estufas. Y este, obviamente la cantidad que se tiene de emisiones de, de estos compuestos, butano, eh, son importantes para lo que es formación de ozono y aerosoles secundarios. Entonces, eh, es importante que los niños sepan que desde su casa pueden incidir en una mejora de la calidad del aire. ¿no? Eh, entonces, trabajamos con diferentes eh, estructuras dentro del mismo gobierno para poder llegar a la población. Sí, gracias. Yes, thank you, Olivia, for your answer. Um, maybe do you have any uh, follow-up questions to our speakers? No, thank you. Uh, really awesome to hear uh, all of those stories. Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions again. Uh, and we have another question in the Q&A feature. I believe it will be more suitable for Olivia to answer this since It, uh, it has a question about the predictions of air quality. So the question is, in the application, we can see how the air quality in our area is predicted. So how the data processing methods are used to produce spatial data from monitoring data that just measure from several points and what kind of software may be that used for the analysis. Mm 
Bueno, básicamente, en, perdón, voy a hablar, Olivia. Este, en el caso de, de México, lo que hacemos nosotros es que tenemos ubicadas todas las colonias y sabemos dentro del área de representatividad de la estación qué colonias son las que están representando esa calidad del aire. Para poderles dar la información donde ellos se ubican, eh, hacemos nada más un match entre la representatividad de la estación y la estación más cercana. Y entonces asociamos la calidad del aire hacia ese lugar. No estamos haciendo interpolación entre estación y estación. Únicamente eh, nos referimos a lo que es la representatividad espacial de la estación para poder dar la información de calidad del aire. Okay, thank you, Olivia. Um, so I hope that answers your questions to anyone that uh, write the questions in the Q&A. Um, I see that there are no more questions from the participants. So perhaps before we end the session, uh, I will ask uh, Olivia and Ms. Rahmawati and also Dr. Norhasni to have a closing statement. Perhaps we can begin with uh, Dr. Norhasni, if you could, if you may. Oh, okay. Uh, because the line is not that clear here. So uh, again, uh, I think based on the um, data or the presentation that has been made by Malaysia, we are committed to ensure that the uh, ambient air quality for Malaysia is uh, a good and uh, Malaysia has implemented to effectively communicate the ambient air monitoring data to the public. So we use a variety of visualizations such as interactive maps, charts and graphs. So hopefully uh, this interactive mechanism will be put in place and will be strengthened. So uh, particularly the interactive maps can show real-time air quality levels across different locations. And, and of course, charts and graphs can illustrate trends over time uh, or compare air quality metrics between different pollutants. And of course, uh, again, uh, this is the opportunity for us to understand more about the uh, implementations and methodologies in other countries. And of course, uh, I have to agree that it is important to use clear and simple visualization that are easy for the public to understand. And of course, to provide the context and explanation to help interpret the data accurately. So additionally, uh, I foresee a lot of color coding uh, and visual cues has been put in this presentation. Uh, this is very much indeed to help to highlight the areas of concern of the to improve the air quality. So overall, uh, thank you again for giving the opportunity for departments and environment uh, in participating in this uh, webinar. And uh, we are trying hard to develop a more effective strategies for the air quality management for Malaysia as well as to support the SDGs. For the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rahasmi. And as for now, we will have um, Mr. Ahmawati to deliver her, her closing statement. Yes. Thank you, Mbak Kalisa. Jadi, saya ucapkan terima kasih uh, juga kita sudah uh, diundang berpartisipasi pada webinar uh, community practice pada hari ini. Uh, harapannya memang dengan webinar seperti ini kita bisa sharing informasi, kemudian sharing data dan sebagainya begitu uh, untuk peningkatan kualitas udara di masing-masing kota gitu ya sehingga uh, apa, hidup bisa lebih nyaman uh, yang apa uh, lebih baik lagi begitu harapannya memang uh, ini akan bisa terus uh, dilangsungkan dan kita bisa uh, terus terlibat dalam uh, community of practice sharing-sharing informasi uh, dan juga uh, apa uh, data sehingga kita bisa uh, menjadi lebih baik lagi. Terima kasih Kalisa. Terima kasih Wei and for the last uh, remark from uh, from Olivia. Yeah. 
Este, sí, muchas gracias por la invitación. Este, de acuerdo en, en poder este, compartir información más adelante con ustedes. Ha sido un placer también conocer lo que, lo que hacen allá en, en sus ciudades. Y este, el monitoreo de calidad del aire no es, no es este, diferente. El monitoreo de calidad del, del aire es el mismo que hacemos. Coincido con, con mis ponentes en donde el reto es poder difundir la información hacia la población y que ésta pueda hacer uso de ella, pero no nada más el uso, sino la apropiación de la información. Eh, no podemos bajar los niveles de contaminación si no hay una participación de, todo, de todos y de todas. Entonces, eh, sí requerimos que entiendan que debemos de ser partícipes todos para poder reducir los niveles de emisiones, para poder bajar los, nive los niveles de, de contaminación en el aire ambiente. Y bueno, pues la academia siempre también es bienvenida a sumarse en estos, en estos trabajos porque ellos le dan el el soporte y la validez al trabajo que venimos haciendo los sistemas de monitoreo. Gracias. Yes, thank you, Alicia, and thank you for our esteemed speakers. And before handing it over to Marita, I would like to recap some, some of the key insights that our esteemed speakers have shared with us. From today's session, we can see how initiatives from, for monitoring and analyzing air quality in each city are tailored to the specific needs of each city and how the air, the air conditions in every city impact the type of communications to the public. For example, in Malaysia, communications is uh, focused on the dangers of air pollution during forest and peatland fires. And meanwhile, in Mexico City, with the volcanoes uh, close to the city, air quality forecasting and contingency warnings are necessary. While in Jakarta, The fragile mobile application, website, and social media communications to disseminate information and air quality index uh, status. And that concludes our city representative session. Thank you once again for being a part of today's webinar. So over to you, mate. Thank you, Kalisha. Um, I think I would just like it's actually a call for prayer but actually i would just like to end the session of course with a uh, deep gratitude for everyone's presence for staying tuned until the end of this session uh, this is not the final session uh, it's only been the second one uh, for online but actually we have done three sessions on the community of practice so We are really open to your uh, interest, to your participation towards the next. Uh, please stay connected uh, in our email and uh, on WRI Indonesia uh, social media for now. Um, also, as uh, my colleague has said, uh, the, the materials will also be sent over to you uh, via email. So, uh, Kalisha, if you don't mind, projecting the last part of our uh, Zoom background so that those who are interested would be able to join uh, the community of practice, uh, I think, mailing list. I think those, yeah. will, those will direct us to the WhatsApp group, right? Okay. So this, this link bit.ly aqcop will direct you uh, will direct your interest to to register for a more frequent update from us. And for more information, you can also visit the WRI uh, website on this initiative. Once again, um, thank you so much for your participation. Again, thank you for the. United States Department of State, to WRI, to everyone who is involved today. Um, see you on the next session. Stay connected. And uh, let's hope for healthier, cleaner air and cities for all. Thank you. And have a good rest of the day and evening for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And have a good weekend. Yes, have a good and restful weekend to all. Thank you.